Tamukan, the throne of chaos. Honored masters, Likmar Vanik is dead. I have the pleasure to report that the renegade, whose continued life has long been a thorn in the side of our most august college, is no more. I took his life personally, following a battle just outside the village of Gunnatarg, between his own forces, a mixture of degenerate cultists and duped villagers for the main, who he had suborned and corrupted under the alias of a witch-hunter, come to rid them of the very ruinous powers he in truth so willingly served. My army, such as it was, was formed from a contingent of the state troops from the nearby fort at Bragenhall, and such mercenaries and zealots as I could stir up and give the time. The battle itself was hardly the largest I have seen, but was bitterly contested and left the locality desolate, and Gunnatarg itself in flames, an outcome perhaps for the best, given the vile proclivities of Vanek and his followers. The renegade himself I caught attempting to flee the field, after the disciplined fire of Bragenhall's handgunners had finally turned the affair in our favour, and his own untamed conjurations had turned upon him in misrule. It was with some satisfaction that I called upon the power of Ogu uh, to beset him and strangled him to death with the darkness of the very thorn thicket in which he sought to flee. Afterwards, I had his body incinerated under the normal precautionary measures and set about the task of doing the same for his lair, which I had discovered in the cellars of the profaned shrine to Sigma within the village. Here, Along with the expected foul paraphernalia of the cult master, I uncovered a number of strange and forbidden manuscripts, which no doubt constituted the sorcerer's arcane library of sorts. Among those were widely known blasphemous texts and tomes, such as von Hunt's uh, Demon Alatria and the Red Fragments of Chahambra, the Mad, and others that I shall not trouble to name, was a most singular and curious manuscript I have not encountered before, bearing the eponymous title of Tamil Khan, or the Throne of Chaos. This strange work, extensive in range and strangely illuminated, takes as its subject the rise and fall of the great warlord of the northern wastes vaguely known to imperial scholars as having led a savage invasion of the Empire's southern lands nearly a decade ago, to the great sorrow and desolation of Wiesenland. The work purports at least to have been penned by one actually within the ranks of the great and foul host, and as such I do not need to stress upon you, honoured masters, its rarity or potential importance if genuine. The great foe is one whose malevolence we must suffer time and again, just as the hurricanes lash the isles of the western seas, and like those great storms to those that cling precariously to life in the sunlands, we know that each fresh calamity could be the end of us. Yet still we endure, the empire endures, and long may it do so. This strange manuscript, then, could be of supreme significance, for it deals with events and peoples in the dark and terrible lands, far removed from our own, yet where many of our troubles are born and we may learn much from it. Or, of course, it may also be no more than a tissue of lies and fabrications, spewed from the forked tongues of the servants of chaos to mislead and corrupt. It is for you, honoured masters, to decide. Your obedient servant, N. The Doom of the Great Kurgan it was said that in ancient days, before even the Great Wall of the East was raised, or hammer-handed Sigma rose in the verdant lands of the Reich, that there grew in the East, beyond the mountains of Morn, the mighty empire of Kurgan, whose cruel dominion covered the vast steppe lands and ranged wide, an empire of swift horsemen, snarling beasts and dread sorceries, that struck down its foe swifter than any arrow, and whose warrior's blades were ever wetted with blood. So mighty was this empire without fortress or border, that its ruler was known only as the Great Kurgan, 
for his domain was naught but an extension of his will. By war and conquest, the great Kurgan gathered all of that vast and warlike race that bore his name beneath his yoke. Those who opposed him, he crushed utterly. Those who threw themselves prostrate before his feet, he made slaves. Only the mighty did he deem worthy to recruit into the ranks of his vast host. And only before the gods of chaos did he kneel. With a never-ending hunger for power over the steppelands and their people, the great Kurgan prayed to the winds of the north, south, east and west. He prayed to the earth and to the sky and to the rain. He prayed to the sun by day and by night to the moon and to the black moon that followed in its wake. He gave up many offerings of captives and plunder. The great Kurgan was mighty, but he knew the forces that ruled the insane realms of the uttermost north were mightier yet, and so in pact with them he became bound, and power they had given him, and in his due he would not falter. The great Kurgan had many wives, but they had borne him only four sons, four brothers who were fierce rivals for their father's favour and the glory of conquest, sons who had now come of age, sons promised to the chaos gods. One day, the great Kurgan drew his sons to him, saying, My sons, it has pleased the gods to give me dominion over all the lands of the Kurgan and far beyond. My realm runs far, and my conquests have been many. Mighty armies of men, orcs and dwarves, I have driven before me, and I have heaped their dead in piles as high as the mountains to attest to my glory in the realms beyond. Never before have the Kurgan known such greatness, nor such glory in battle. Then our name alone now strikes fear into the hearts of the world. The sons of the great Kurgan cheered, for they were eager to shed the blood of their father's enemies, whoever they might be. But at that moment, within the tent city of the Kurgan, a storm erupted to quell their laughter. A harrowing wind assailed the Kurgan multitude, bringing with it strange scents of blood, rot, perfume, and scorching fire. At this omen, all cast themselves upon the ground in obeisance, be they warrior, sorcerer, or slave, for the chaos gods were at hand. In the tent of the great Kurgan, Banners and trophies were cast contemptuously down, and the four sons were struck dumb with fear as their father fell to his knees, knowing it was time to pay the heavy price that had been set by the chaos gods for his victories. Casting a bitter look upon his precious sons, he said, But for each bargain there is a price, and it is the gods' pleasure to take from a man what he most treasures, though he might not know its value before it is too late. And now I must pay my dues. The tent city was suddenly filled with the minions of the dark gods in all their endless variety. Demons came then, cavorting and savage. Demons of rot and slaughter. Demons of excess and transformation. Come to collect their due for a bargain paid in full. The greater gods of chaos took the great Kurgan's sons from him. Four souls screaming as each was transfigured with the stigmata of each of the great Kurgan's patrons. Corn, gore-clad lord of battle. Nurgle, corrupt father of plagues. Slanesh, prince of fell pleasures. And Zench, the changer of the ways. With his only sons taken, the great Kurgan shed no tears, but raised up his skull chalice in thanksgiving to his masters, even though from that day after, every victory would be a hollow one for him, and every pleasure would taste of ashes. The bargain complete, the fickle gods turned their attentions elsewhere, and met the great Kurgan's prayers with cold silence. Although still mighty, an ill-omened shade now befell the great Kurgan, and men whispered dark things at his passing, and warriors made offerings to the gods after his shadow fell over them to avoid his curse. Soon, with no bloodline to follow him, intrigue and murder grew rife among his chieftains and sorcerers, each vying for their own glory and power. Now his succession was marked as ended. So it was that in a handful of years did the great Kurgan see his vaunted empire fall to ruin, 
its glory trampled into the dust. And when the great Kurgan finally fell, none would speak of his final fate. And, as he became all but forgotten, a fireside legend among the men of the North. But, as for his four sons, given over to the winds of chaos, it was said that the gods had other plans for their playthings, and in time each would have a fitting doom of their own. The Tribes of Chaos The vast and desolate steppeland and rocky wastes of the far north are, despite their bleak and barren appearance, far from uninhabited. In addition to the scattered tribes of orcs, savage trolls, and all manner of strange beasts and unnatural horrors, they are, first and foremost, home to many ancient, semi-nomadic clans and tribes of humans, known chiefly in the Old World as the Marauders of Chaos. These are a fierce, warlike people, and although there exists marked differences in appearances and culture between their individual tribes, they are without exception savage-hearted and touched by chaos, both in body and soul. Only the strong prosper amongst their kind as war, hardship and continuous danger of living so close to the literal edge of chaos take their toll and winnow out the weak and foolish early on. Raised to survive in this harsh environment, there is no man nor woman of the northern tribes that reaches adulthood without having become inured to violence and horror, and who is not fully prepared and skilled enough to take another's life, either for gain, honour, or the glory of the chaos gods. To them, the folk of the southern lands are weak and self-deluded wretches, who place value in petty godlings and follies of stone that they believe will protect them from the oncoming storm. The common folk of other lands are to them nothing but snivelling cowards who kneel to their masters, not to the strong by right of arms, but because they are little more than cattle, slaves in their souls to their soft priests and the demands of their grasping liar kings and lords, and therefore deserve no better than to be crushed by the strong. To the tribes of the north, be they of raven-haired Kurgan, the pale-skinned Norskans, or the lithe Hung, power and might is all, and that a man or woman may carve such a legend for themselves that may be remembered in story and gain the favour of the dark gods is their greatest desire. Beyond the often tenuous links of tribal affiliation, family and bloodline, They have little concept of allegiance to state or nation, and certainly no loyalty save that which they have given freely to a warlord or champion. These ties are strengthened only through victory and clear sign of the favour of the gods, and will swiftly evaporate if they are defeated or their commander shows any sign of weakness. Even within their own tribal groups, they will often fight to the death over slights to their honour, petty insults, whether perceived or real, or simply to test and prove their martial prowess. They are a nomadic people who care little for borders and simply take what they want from other lands if they are strong enough to do so, be it by longship raids, in the case of the Norse, are under thunderous hooves as their tribes ride into battle, sweeping across the steppe like a great swarm of locusts. Despite all of this, and the inhuman savagery their reputation speaks of in more civilised lands, the marauders of the north are still human, and the differences between them and the southern folk of the old world and far Cathay are paltry compared to, say, a human and an elf or orc. And the wise know them not as some separate race, but as merely a dark reflection of what lies in all men's hearts, the desire to conquer and survive despite all odds. The true difference, then, lies in the shadow of chaos that swallows their lives, customs and beliefs like a shroud. In the north, in the shadowed lands that lie within the grasp of the realm of chaos, the dark and ruinous gods of chaos, and the sanity-blasting, flesh-warping influence of raw magic, is as real and accepted a force in men's lives as wind and rain, birth and death. They are both undeniable, 
and indefatigable. To live under their gaze is to know the world remade anew, in nightmare, at the whim of demons, and to see all sense of permanency or control swept aside to satiate the appetites of the Chaos Gods and their myriad petty rivalries and insidious games, played out with mankind as their favoured and chief gaming pieces. Confronted with such malign omnipotence, the tribes of the North are both fearful and devout, and seek to propitiate and gain the favour of the gods with appropriate sacrifices and deeds carried out in their honour, so to gain their favour, or at least mollify their spite. In doing so, the strength of their belief and emotions complete the circle and sustain the chaos gods in power. The vast majority of those men and women live and die under the shadow of chaos worship and revere each of the four greater powers, Korn, Nurgle, Slanesh and Zench in turn, as well as lesser and more numerous demons and spirits of chaos to whom they have connections by bloodline, history, pact or place. Thusly, might a warrior pray to Korn, the blood god, for prowess in victory and in battle, offer up sacrifice to Nurgle, the desolate one, in time of famine or plague, or to afflict their enemies, Slanesh, the decadent for plunder, and for fulsome feasting and celebration in victory, and to Zench for cunning, and that the rage of storm and sea might submit to their will. Every facet of the world and life belongs in some way to one of the gods of chaos, and there are many among the tribes of the north who account it suicidal folly to spurn one of the great powers their due. There are, however, some who claim the patronage of a single chaos god, a disavowing worship of all others in the name of a single supreme master, and in return, and should their hellish divinity find them worthy, they may be granted the boon of an unholy pact which empowers and harnesses but the merest sliver of their god's might and nature. But this alone is enough to set them apart from other men in strength and unnatural abilities. Such a pact is a perilous one, for as power is given, so too is great risk, and the dark path of such devotion can lead to the warrior being entirely consumed, body and soul either becoming little more than a hollow extension of Chaos's immortal will, or physically devolving into a mutated mindless spawn. The greatest of these zealous devotees and god-sworn warriors will rise to become the champions of Chaos, warrior lords and sorcerers whose power and skill is all but unmatched in the world, peerless killers and conquerors whose burning desire for dominion and ascendancy is fueled and amplified by the immortal fury of the Chaos Gods. Theirs is the will and fame that gathers the marauders and warriors of the North into armies of such metal that the world trembles at their tread. Theirs is the gaze that quells the hearts of beast and spawn alike, and theirs is the favour of the gods, such that even demon kind is theirs to command. It is these chaos lords alone that have the ability to wield the disparate and warlike tribes and nomadic warbands of the wastes into ravaging armies, numbering in the thousands and even tens of thousands, folding within their ranks Giants, trolls, ogres, and other beasts too singular and horrific to have a common name. In doing so, they may forge a force strong enough to challenge the very existence of the empires of the old world. Then they pour down from the north to threaten every land and realm, bringing with them raw madness and merciless destruction in attacks some scholars know as the Great Incursions, which occur when the power of chaos waxes strong. Yet even for these few chosen sons and daughters, the path is a treacherous one. For while each may dream of gaining the chaos god's ultimate and rarest gift, immortality in the incarnation of a demon prince, 
Most will succumb to a glorious death in battle and damnation, or even betrayal by their own. Chapter 1 Blind I am, who was once far in sight and swift in malice, cursed and punished to recount not mine own glory and mine own tragedies, but the glories and terrible sagas of others who have borne the bloody blade of champion before the great gods of chaos. It is I, their chronicler, alone who may tell their tales, spilling their secrets with my viper's tongue and burning venomed ink. For those with the wisdom to see and the wit to tell steal edged truth from honeyed lie. Beware, for such knowledge is as treacherous as the path to greatness in the service of chaos itself. Know then that this is the saga of Tamakan, Maggot Lord, son of the great Kurgan of old, favoured of Nurgle, warlord, tyrant, canker, worm, and false king, Tamakan the Great, Tamakan the Fool, pawn of prophecy and bringer of slaughter, Tamakan, he who sought the throne of chaos. In the year of the crow, in the sixth reign of the black moon, by the Norsecan reckoning, the never-ending tempest that crowns the storm that is known to men as the realm of chaos waxed gibbous and grasping. All across the Northlands the earth shifted and moaned, as if it were a sleeper beset by nightmares. Battle graves vomited forth their unquiet dead, and she-beast and mortal woman alike were greatly blessed with the taint of chaos in their birthings. All men knew that a time of great portents was at hand, and rumours spread like grassland fires of sundered prisons and baleful visitations, of great monsters bestirred from their slumbers in the caves and mires of the wastes, and of sorceries leaping eager into the minds of those with the wit to seize them. War was coming as it had countless times before, and would do so countless times again. Red War, the likes of which every North man, be they Dalgon, Chian, or Kazag, feels the calling of in their bones and cannot resist. War at the pleasure of the Chaos Gods. With the call to battle tugging at their minds and souls, some wasted no time in falling first upon their own, striving in bloody combat to prove their worth before their tribe and their gods for the battle to come. Others, tormented by dreams and visions, quested alone, travelling ever northward to where the world itself was ripped apart. Of these dark pilgrims, some found paths to bleak and nightmarish shrines where they came to claim a blessing and pledge their allegiance to one of the great powers, while many merely found death. Feeling the breath of chaos at their neck, and hearing its honeyed whispers of promises of their ascendancy and destruction in equal measure, many exalted champions and would-be warlords across the Northlands bestirred themselves for battle. For some, the prospect of fighting familiar foes and settling ancient feuds was enough to call on their savagery and spur them to action alone, while others, superstitious and pious in their dark religion, sought the favour of the gods by divining prophecies and the calling of demonic summonings for law and guidance as to where their blow should fall. Fickle and contradictory are the gods of chaos, and treacherous their demon kin. For each visitation and augury was a different answer given, and for each a different path to glory illuminated. Yet within the cacophony of maddening lies, lick-spittle truths and burning secrets, there were names and whispers that reverberated and echoed time and again to some, of the ever-chosen yet to rise, of Zambijan, the fallen city the serpent's moon and the dead grail of the knights of fire and ash, and of the throne of chaos, of undying dominion over the mortal world in demon flesh, a prize ripe for the taking. So it came to pass 
in the Kurgan lands where the legends of the blasted plateau of Kadatha and the ancient ruins of Zambijan that surmounted it were well known, that many warlords and mighty champions of chaos were drawn to quest for its cold heights. Although said to exist somewhere to the east, the Kadatha was also known to shift and wane like a mirage on the horizon, and an unfavoured warrior might be driven mad, or starve, without ever reaching it, although it hovered on the horizon before them. But now, as the realm of chaos waxed in power, the great plateau of blasted Kadatha lay open for any that would dare climb the razor-sharp rocks of its passes to give battle in the shadow of the ancient ruins at its summit. Zambijan, the fallen city, was older than man, and had long served as an arena where the chaos gods watched their mortal followers vie for their favour in violent combat. When the champions and their armies came to battle here, each hoped to prove their worth and the superiority of their patron over all others, and now would be no exception. A champion who was a victor here would be marked for greatness, and by ancient tradition become master of those they vanquished. The fame of such a warlord would spread throughout the northern wastes, and many would flock to their banner in promise of the glories to come. Eventually, three mighty armies came to make war in the shadow of the timeless twisted pillars of Zambijan. First from the west came the brazen armoured warriors of Hakka the Isling, his axemen drawn up in brutal column, each accompanied by packs of blood-crazed gore-spawn and flayed hounds snapping at their leashes. From the east came Sagaf the Vane, horse lord of the Yurtsak, at whose bequest the paramours of Slanesh danced. Sagaf, though but young in years, was already a legend among his people, and his marauders and horse-mounted reavers were legion in number, and weighed down with unnatural appetites that hungered to be satiated. From the south came the witch-cabal of Uruk Solbane, arch-sorcerer and demon priest, at whose beckoning the earth and rocks themselves spat forth twisted killing shapes, and above whose head vultures whirled on wings of flame. Although comparatively few, Compared to the other greater forces, the witch cult was deadly, and its fanatic acolytes and sorcerers could match many times their own number in combat. Soon battle was joined, and the slaughter was great. By spell and sword, fanged moor and burning talon, lives were claimed and blood was shed in profusion for the god's pleasure. The dead plazas of the fallen city echoed once more to the song of steel and the piteous cries of the dying. Hour after hour, day after day, the forces clashed and parted in the heartbeat rhythm of war. Of the free forces, none gained the upper hand, for while the fury of Hacker's berserkers was unsurpassed, it was countered by the numbers of Sagaf's vast host, who spitted themselves on their foes' blades in unholy bliss, and dragged them down, only to be beaten back from victory in turn by the scouring hellfire of Uruk's witch-cabal, striking when triumph seemed assured. Each force grew more desperate for victory, as the bodies stacked deep in the cold dust, as the moons passed overhead, and a great tumult of baleful light caught hold in the skies above Kadatha, both as a sign of the god's pleasure and as a beacon to draw in others with a promise of glory like moths to a flame. The fighting ran on unabated, and soon, where thousands had battled before, tens of thousands now flocked to join the conflict, both swelling the armies of the mighty champions who already fought and adding a roll call of petty warlords, hungering creatures of chaos and their followers as minor factions into the fray. When the moon of Mansleeb died in the east, and the black moon, Morsleeb, rose in the ascendancy, another host appeared on the horizon, carrying with it a great miasma of shadow and pestilence. It had begun 
as a flood of distorted, nightmarish beings dredged from the depths of the cold mires, hungering bile trolls, worm men, and hideous nameless things dripping rot and slime. At the head of this monstrous horde was a rotted yet living cadaver astride a mighty toad dragon, a huge beast that shook the earth with each bloated stride it took. The cadaver that called itself Tamakan, the Maggot Lord, servant of the god of pestilence and father of all diseases, Nurgle. Like the other Chaos Warlords, Tamakan had been drawn to Kedatha by the promises of power beyond mortal imagining, but from the beginning he was amongst the four who had been marked for glory by his patron god. As Tamakan had set out from his fetid lair, the Lord of Decay, the great and pestilent god Nurgle himself, had sent forth a dark and noxious storm that howled and screamed before the rancid column of beasts and half-men he commanded, carrying the certain promise of death and ruin to follow. Whilst the moon had dwindled in the night sky, the horde of Tamakan wound ever westward towards blasted Kadatha, where battle already raged. Drawn in his wake were many fierce warriors who owed fealty to the corrupt father of plagues, heedless of loyalty to tribe or war band, so highly blessed in Father Nurgle's favour, Tamakan clearly was. From all the domains of the Northlands, champions of decay clamoured to the cavalcade of their new master, and soon names already legend for the desolation they had wrought, such as Kaisak the Befouled, master of an order of corrupt and rotted Chaos Knights, and the dragon rider Orbel Vipergut came to pledge to him their filth-stained blades in allegiance. With every great warrior of renown came also a host of lesser fighters, tribesmen and subhuman dregs in profusion, and in places known for pestilence and corruption, so many flocked to join the horde of Tamakan that where they marched, the land was emptied by the cry to war. Most of those who rallied to the ragged banners of Nurgle were already marked by the rank favours of their patron lord, the god of plague, and some were so corrupted by disease and disfigurement they were barely recognisable as the broken remnants of men, yet all were eager to serve in their fashion. Tamakan's coming to blasted Kadatha was heralded by dark signs and portents, and even as his mouldering host mounted the passes to the plateau, the dead of battle that littered fallen Zanbijan started to shudder and seethe with unholy life. Not, though, the dark animation of necromancy, but with huge, bloated carrion flies that had bred in the rotted organs of the dead. The juddering corpses now burst forth in a hateful biting swarm to cloud the skies in sickly clouds and fill the fallen city with their murmurous wing-beats. With this foul omen at hand, the witch cult of Uruk Solbane, arcanist of Zench, fled Zambijan, spitting burning curses in their wake, their master having divined of doom should he stay to fight, for the archenemy's hour was at hand. For the bitter rival Sargath and Hacker, and many of the rest caught up in the conflict, however, nothing could stay their enmity. Even the coming of this fourth host to contest the city and the hellish swarms of biting flies that preceded it. So it was that Tamakan's plague-ridden host fell upon the two greater armies as they were already engaged in bloody battle for the wide plaza at the centre of the dead city. The slaughter was great, and swiftly many of the minor warbands were crushed or driven from the field in disarray, and those not trapped between warring factions or blinded by bloodlust took to flight rather than risk overwhelming destruction while Sargaf's and Hacker's forces fought on, unbowed. At the height of the battle, the skies were rent open and foul and caustic rain fell in great sheets. 
At the tainted rain's touch, the flesh of the dead petrified and ran like melting wax, and open wounds festered as the vanguards of the three great warlords met in battle at the plaza's centre. The proud and vicious steeds of the Yurtzak marauders were soon mired and lamed as obscene tendrils of rancid liquid rose up to drag them down to drown within the horrific mass as the horde of Tamakan smashed into their flank with shattering force. The embattled combatants turned and counterattacked this new enemy, and pox-scarred madmen screamed their misery and joy as they fell while bloated demons droned the count of the dead and the dying. Sargaf's sworn sorcerers responded with twisting enchantments of their own, searing the oncoming plague beasts with pavanes of coruscating energy, blinding and misleading its warriors with murderous illusions. But all was in vain as the disordered lines of Sargoth's marauders and cavalry, caught in place and robbed of the strength of mobility, crumbled before the implacable tide of rot and terror before them. While Sargaf's most powerful troops, his mutant forsaken, were caught between the onslaught of Kaisak the befouled Chaos Knights on one side, and the frenzied, flayed hounds of Hacker's forces, who had been driven utterly insane by the corrosive rain and devouring flies on the other. Seeing the tide of battle turned against him, Sagath, his pride stung and his rage uncontrollable at the prospect of defeat, charged his own bodyguard of Chaos Knights at the heart of Tamakan's forces, calling for the head of the one who had so insulted him with the presumption of the attack on Slanesh's favoured son. His white enamelled armour, splattered with blood and unmentionable filth, Sargoth, whose blade skill was legend, hacked and slew his way to face his new enemy, with his narrow rune blade, as sharp as sin, slicing through rusted armour and decayed neck alike, he carved his way to face Tamakan directly, arrogant and scorning the forces that surrounded him, Sargath. Prince of Chaos poured insults upon the withered figure that slumped bonelessly atop the vast, hulking beast before him. The toad dragon, Bubolus, was the size of a townhouse, its armoured bulk already scored and scratched with dozens of wounds that had done nothing to stop its rampage, while its great claws were clotted with the crimson gore of scores of victims caught in its path. The rotted figure atop the monster spat back its own taunts in reply, and at the slightest gesture of command, Bubolus reared up and opened its vast and reeking maw wide. But even as the toad dragon unleashed a blast of unspeakable foulness from its gaping mouth, the inhumanly live Sargath leapt from the back of his chaos steed and high into the air. As a mere instant later, his former mount was liquefied into screaming, necrotic ooze. Sargaf's leap took him to the very head of the beast itself, and his once white armour rusted in the backwash of Bubolus's vile breath. But he had found his purchase on the toad dragon's horn. With a cry of triumph, Sargaf swung himself upwards at the toad dragon's rider, and with the speed of a striking serpent sunk his rune blade deep into Tamakan's heart. Tamakan merely laughed, and Sargaf's howl of triumph was choked off. As the withered cadaver before him squirmed, bulged, and split open like rotten fruit, and Tamakan's true form was revealed, a child-sized maggot streaked with greyish slime, its multifaceted black eyes glittering, pulsed and leapt at the exposed throat piece of Sargaf's armour, tearing it aside and boring deep into the perfumed flesh beneath. The maggot's fatted body writhed and twisted obscenely as it pushed its way behind Sargaf's ribcage, which splintered and cracked the maggot thing devouring and boring ever deeper into the living organism within. The champion of Slanesh's body fell limply into the fetid mire of the battlefield, and when it rose again, Bubolus bellowed 
in deafening exultation, and the servants of decay gibbered and capered in bleak joy as Tamokan, newly fleshed, mounted again his war beast. The heart ripped from them by their master's defeat. Sargaf's marauders fell into full and panic retreat, and hundreds were cut down, caught between the brain beasts and madmen of Tamokan's forces, freshly invigorated by their master's triumph and the tireless blades of the Aislings' blood-worshippers at their backs. Many hundreds more escaped, calling upon their god for deliverance, fleeing down the crazed and pillared paths of the fallen city and becoming swallowed up by the labyrinth. Haka himself, now vastly outnumbered and outmatched, committed his own soul and the souls of his followers to corn and hurled himself and his bodyguard into the thick of Tamokan's bestial vanguard. At this sundering charge of savage fury, the battle lines of Nurgle's children wavered, but did not break. And as the weight of the forces against them pressed down, Hacker the Aisling was swept apart from those about him by the tide of battle, and despite the whirlwind fury of his twin axes, he was soon torn apart by the grasping claws of bile trolls, his body so shredded and devoured that no part of him could be found for trophy after the battle. With victory in Tamakan's grasp, the skies were rent with sickly green lightning, and the foul rain fell in a great downpour, tainting the dead stones of Zambijan with filth, and the sound of the great storm's thunder carried with it the bleak echoes of Father Nurgle's laughter. Tamukan proclaimed his victory to the gods from a mound of heaped and rotting dead, as the banners of the vanquished were cast down at his feet. Before all, he cried out his name and lineage, claiming to be the twisted son of the great Kurgan of old, returned to his savage birthright to slay and conquer. He praised Father Nurgle, who had brought him his blessings, and declared his intention to claim the throne of Chaos for his own. By right of conquest, the surviving warband leaders and Chaos champions vowed him their fealty in battle. So long as he brought them victories, they would follow him. Amongst them were many who, until this moment, had considered themselves implacable enemies, rivals for mortal power and divine favour, bitter foes who would rather perish than make a common cause. Yet even these swore to fight as one in the name of Tamakan the Maggot Lord, agreeing to lay their feuds aside, for the while at least. News of Tamakan's great victory spread, and soon the sons of the Marauder tribes, wandering killers, unspeakable horrors and power-hungry cults, began to flock to his banner as he departed from the charnel bedecked ruins of Zambijan, and headed again northward. In this manner the horde grew each day as it tramped across the steppe lands, towards the foothills of the snow-topped Altean hills, and Tamakan's next goal. By the time that the moon had grown full and ebbed once more, the horde's column of march stretched almost from horizon to horizon, and the flies and carrion crows clung about it as to a rotting carcass. Those that were cleaved close to Tamakan travelled at the head of the great horde, while those that kept divine loyalties of their own, or kept no single god, formed parasite columns that shadowed the main body of the force, keeping a weary distance, well aware that Nurgle's pestilence cared little for whose flesh it corrupted. Within a moon's passing, the Horde reached the Altaian hills and the roughly defined territory of a fierce confederacy of marauder tribes called the Dolgan. The Dolgan were one of the largest and most powerful of all the nations of the Kurgan peoples, renowned for their fractious nature and insular hatred of other Northmen. Tamokan desired greatly to bring these warriors into his cause, and particularly to add to his host the powerful war mammoths they were famed to ride into battle, huge creatures, able to trample legions of lesser troops underfoot and serve as living siege engines should the need arise. The overlord of the Dolgan tribes at that hour was the infamous sorcerer Sail the Faithless, 
a malformed and treacherous creature whose many betrayals, murders and atrocities were as famed as his great powers as a seer and battle wizard. Sale had not been deaf to the tales that had already reached the Dolgan lands of Tamokan's victory and the favour the Chaos Gods had shown the Maggot Lord and the size of the host he had already amassed to his banner. Having foreseen Tamokan's coming in the entrails of sacrifices, the scheming sorcerer sought not to meet the oncoming horde head-on, for in that he saw, at best, a costly victory, and more likely a bitter defeat, but instead to use Tamokan's ascendancy to his own advantage in some way. Despised by much of his own people, Sael's grip on power among the Dolgan was a tenuous one, and he was beset on all sides by many enemies, both within and without the Dolgan tribes. Sale cunningly used his influence to send many of those he suspected of disloyalty to harass and delay Tamakan's horde, and in doing so consign them to their doom. Then, instead of meeting the horde in open battle as they ravaged across the Dolgan heartland, Sale opted instead to parlay from a position of strength with the full intention of joining his forces to those of Tamokan, at least as long as it proved expedient to do so. Tamokan was eager to oblige this alliance, and while Sal pledged no oath of loyalty, only comradeship and common cause, Tamokan was satisfied that his goals were met, and his force had not been squandered to gain what he wanted. In this bargain, Sal at first Confident that he had gotten the better of the bargain, soon found himself caught within his own web of scheming, for while he had assumed Tamokan's intention was to lead his horde in a swift, crashing attack against the southern lands directly, as had been the want of many of the prior incursions of chaos, thus enabling Sal to share in the glory and plunder, and return soon in triumph to the Dolgan, he soon learned that Tamokan had other, stranger plans in mind. Instead of turning south and west towards the rich prizes of Kislev and the Empire, Tamokan led his horde, now numbering in the tens of thousands, with the addition of those Dolgan Sal had pledged to his cause, ever northwards, on an erratic path into the harsh climate and horror-infested wastes on the very edge of the hellish storm of the realm of chaos itself. This caused consternation in the ranks of the newly formed host, and some began to tremulously whisper that Tamakan sought to make war upon the gods themselves. Such fears at least proved unfounded when, like a great serpent coiling in the dust, Tamokan turned the column northeastwards, and those versed in the dark lore of the plague god soon divined where Tamokan was headed, a place of nightmare and legend, to rival any in the chaos wastes, the Gallows Tree. The Gallows Tree was a warped and horrific entity in its own right. Its tangled limbs were coiled and spread as if distorted in pain and held high above a rot-strewn swamp of vine-choked thorns. Looming higher than a temple steeple above the desolate wastes, foul and unutterable things dwelt beneath its canopy and crawled through the filth loam beneath. The tree was also a living gateway to the horrors beyond, and it was said that deep within its putrescent depths dwelt an unclean hag demon, shunned even by her own kind, who would bestow hidden secrets and dark prophecy on those who pleased her. Those, however, who failed to meet her standards of noisome devotion to Father Nurgle, ended their time as grisly adornments hanging from the boughs of the great tree above. Food for maggots and crows alike, after they had been subjected to a fate more terrible than a sane mind could conceive of by the hag demon first. Tamakan brought his vast horde to the edge of the fetid mire that surrounded the gallows tree, and none save the most devoted and insane disciples of Nurgle would venture further. It was Tamakan alone that braved the deadly path to the foot of the gallows tree and step within. 
Left under the nominal command of Kazik the Befouled, the nascent war host arrayed itself across the plain to await the judgment of the gods, isolating itself into weary camps, distrusting of their neighbours, even while brought together in divinely ordained cause. Long days passed, and while the horde remained encamped in the wastes, with the black and many-hued storm radiance from the realm of chaos rending the distant skies above them, the host's numbers continued to swell with warriors keen to taste battle and savour the rewards of victory. Some came from as far away as the lands of Gaha in the north and of the Avags in the east, while dozens of renowned champions of chaos born of many races, some from far beyond the wastes, were led to the camp by strange visions and whispered promises. As the days went on, Sale, seeking to establish himself as a power in the Horde, sent parties of Dolgan horsemen roaming the wastes, gathering together such reinforcements as they could, as well as stealing the lion's share of the forage available in the wind-swept and desolate land about them. Soon, picket forces needed to be sent out by the various warlords of the host to guard against attack by the warlike dragon ogres and other creatures that lived in the high mountains nearby. Although sometimes, when their parties failed to return, they rightly suspected each other, rather than the appetites of the denizens of the wastes as the cause of their demise. Despite these privations, overall the horde rested and grew stronger as it awaited the return of Tamokan. But... As its master's absence dragged on into a near moon's passage in time, the monstrous and bestial members of the Horde grew restive, and even hungrier, with naught but erstwhile allies on which to dine, and both growing acrimony between disparate factions and other more mundane dangers threatened to undo the Horde before it ever saw a foreign land to ravage. Soon, what wells could be dug in the barren land had become so foul and exhausted that there threatened ignominious death from thirst for many if the delay carried on. When Tamakan at last returned from within the Stygian depths of the gallows tree, it was to the immediate rejoicing of the devotees of Nurgle within the Horde and the weary respect of those who shared the goal of conquest rather than Tamakan's faith. All could plainly see that the Maggot Lord had been marked by the Chaos Gods. Such was his transformation. It is said that time may flow differently for a mortal who steps foot in the beyond, that it may rush by like a river in flood or trickle slowly like blood from a wound that will not clot. And for Tamakan, it seemed at least, his sojourn had ravaged Sargaf's once handsome features, as if a lifetime of befouled degradation had passed by. His eyes were now sunken luminous orbs which shed a sickly greenish light, while Sargaf's once gleaming armour was now a mass of pitted corrosion and was swarming with bloated parasites. Nor had he returned empty-handed, for with him he bore a rancid scroll of power, upon which were graven the true names of demons and monstrous creatures in shifting, blighted script, and a huge, filth-stained amphora in which festered the poisoned waters of Nurgle's hellish domain. Upon his return, Tamakan set about gathering together a score of the most powerful champions and sorcerers in the Horde in a war council in order to share with them the revelations he had been given and planned the Horde's march to conquest. Sargaf's honeyed voice had been transfigured to no more than a guttural rasp since Tamakan had taken the Chaos Princeling for a host, but it had lost none of its power, and indeed, fired by Tamakan's overwhelming arrogance and self-belief, he held his audience of warlords and dark magi all but spellbound for many hours. Tamakan declared once more his desire for what the legends of the Waste referred to as the Throne of Chaos, dominion over the mortal world upon a heaped mountain of bodies, which if won, would buy such favour from the Chaos Gods that immortality and ascendancy to the ranks of the archdemons of Chaos was certain reward. 
Tamakan meant to claim the throne of chaos for himself, and so surpass the deeds of his father, the great Kurgan, in glory and destruction. He declared that those that went with him upon this sacred war would know battle and renown as in the greatest sagas of the wastes, a thousand thousand lives perishing before their blades in unholy prayer to the dark gods and their names and deeds carved into the skin of the world for the powers beyond to see. In the dwelling of the hag demon, he had been shown much, hellish visions of what would be and what could be made real by the will to make it so. He had foreseen a mighty host of chaos, as numberless as a locust swarm, covering the mountains and fallen cities of the dead, titans like a spreading contagion. He had seen mighty giants bow down before him in homage, and the fires and hellish forges of Tsar beating out his name. He had seen the countless dead in their wake as a forest of spitted corpses, and verdant plain and barren waste alike watered in blood, and mighty rivers damned by the bloated carcasses of the fallen, and found it pleasing. Above all else, in his dark communion, he had seen a great city of iron and marble torn down, its walls crumbling into dust, fire running through its streets like water in flood. It would be here that the skies would open for him, boiling away all that was wholesome into yellow pus and cancerous black, and he would be transfigured in glory. The city he knew, though he had never laid eyes upon it, for it lived and breathed in the tales of the Kurgan. It was a city in the heart of the domain of the old enemy, the thrice-damned Sigmar's empire. Although none of those gathered in the horde, not least of all Tamakam himself, had set foot within the empire of man, all knew of it in story and oft-repeated legend. It had been a place of great and glorious battle for many generations, and many a powerful warlord had writ his saga there or died in the attempt. It was a land of deep forests and mighty cities, the size and strength of which could barely be conceived by the men of the north, to whom such things were an anathema given their nomadic, bellicose culture, their closest reference point being the ancient ruins, such as Zambijan, that lay here and there about the shifting landscape of the wastes. Tamakan knew, however, that mere numbers and warlike strength alone had not been enough to crush the empire in the past, for it was a realm of steel and wizardry, blasting fire and bleak castles. They had long withstood the plethora of their enemies that surrounded it and looked upon it with envious eyes. No matter his own arrogance and hubris, Tamakan judged that to wrest this great prize for the glory of chaos, he would need to match Sigma's heirs power for power. He would need to counter their strong walls and towering fortresses with unholy and unstoppable engines of war, and overwhelm their vaunted black powder and battle wizardry with great beasts and savage demons, to whom such things were a mere distraction. Then, would the superior martial skill and battle lust of the scions of chaos prove ascendant? Then, would the dark god's will be done and the empire would be drowned in a sea of its own blood? Tamagard's plan of attack, therefore, would be an indirect one. He would not, as had so many chaos lords of the past, assail the empire from its northeastern border through Kislev and the strongest and most well-tried defences of the realm. Instead, as his vision foretold, his host would travel the length of the mountains of Morn, crushing all in their path and lining their way with charnel monuments to the chaos gods. From there they would then cross the Darklands and join with the forces of the Fire Lords of Tsar. They would cross the mountains and rip up into the Empire from the south, like a dagger striking at the heart, up through the belly where the flesh was soft and weak. The journey would be long, but glorious in souls, battle and plunder. Tamakan promised the warlords gathered before him, the weak would perish along the way and the strong be made stronger. Tempered by battle and blessed by the dark gods for their victories and the carnage inflicted in their name. 
A great roar of triumph and anticipation of the glory to come went up from the host as each renewed their pledges of fealty to Tamokan while the Chaos Gods favoured him. Only Sail, withdrawn in the shadows, remained silent, the faithless one keeping his own counsel. The Children of Chaos Beastmen is a collective term given by the people of the Old World to several related breeds of bestial mutants that haunt the dark places of the wild. Twisted hybrid mockeries of man and animal, they are creatures born of chaos in whose nature all that is brutal and foul is concentrated and amplified into feral savagery. Thick-witted but cunning, their cruelty is boundless and they live short, violent and vicious lives as raiders and despoilers, gathering together in rough tribes known commonly as bray herds or war herds to plunder and despoil under the leadership of the strongest amongst them. These savage tribes, as well as including the common run of beastmen warriors, or gores as they are known, also number in their ranks bulking minotaurs, massive blood-hungry monstrosities, favoured of the dark gods, winged harpies, swift-footed centigores, and all manner of other strange and unnatural creatures. The Shunned Lands Beyond the mountains of Morn, and between the trackless steppe, lie many forgotten and savage lands whose names and inhabitants are nothing more than dark myth to the peoples of the old world. This is a barren and masterless realm, an expanse of bleak and fog-shrouded wilderness, spirit-haunted fens and shattered cities, a howling, desolate place saturated with the darkest magics, where the malice of dread souls and the whisperings of demons hold more sway over the land than sanity, and mundane geography, and travellers can become unutterably lost as the very land itself around them shifts with malignant intelligences, and entities older than the fall of the old ones slumber beneath their black sands. It is a place where the winds of magic are drawn to a swirl and eddy invisible, and great and terrible storms of magic rip unexpectedly into being bringing further literal chaos, sending forests crawling across the landscape like damned souls, and upending mountains to drift through the hurricane-racked air as reality liquefies and remakes itself in twisted new patterns. It is little wonder, then, that even the mighty ogres of the West and the treacherous hobgoblin hordes of the East avoid these shunned lands where they can, ignorant of their true nature, but not the evil that dwells within them. Chapter 2 The great host of Tamakan, the Maggot Lord, set forth with the baleful lights of the realm of chaos waxen above them, casting down their sickly and fabulous radiance on those below. Under this unhallowed light, Many were stricken with visions, and others were blessed with the touch of insanity by the Dark God's revelations. Men and beasts fell and were changed, their bodies contorting and mutating anew into shapes more pleasing to their masters, and those around them rejoiced, letting out great howls of triumph, for surely by this omen was their cause blessed. So it was that Tamakan led them forth from the northern wastes. They were as a stain upon the land, a spreading plague of dispoil and devastation that burned like a fire through the arid grasslands of the eastern steppe, driving all before it. Ever swelling, with a promise of victory was the host, as warriors and madmen, marauders and beasts, flocked to Tamakan's fly-blown standard and fell in with the horde. Soon their number could not well be counted, for as numerous as a swarm of locusts they had become. They shook the ground as they walked, and all that was sane and natural recoiled at their touch. The hobgoblin wolf tribes of the steppes, as vicious and numerous as they were, were yet cowards, 
and fled in vast numbers before the hordes coming, rather than offer battle, their small and blackened souls quelling before the shadow of chaos. For its provander the great horde emptied the sparse lands about it as it travelled, and ahead of its free legion-strong columns an arrowhead of thousands of swift-mounted horsemen went abroad, spying out the land and falling in savagery on anything they encountered for meat and murder. The Scouring of the Stone Lands There are more forces which govern the mortal world than mere intractable nature and reason, for the winds of magic hold dominion over all, and magic is chaos. So great was the horde, so dark the souls and bloody their intent, that the invisible breath of magic was drawn to them, and found form in their collective desire. So it was that time and distance began to twist and blister in the barren stonelands, where there was no will but the will of the horde, and within a single moon's passing they had devoured a span of many hundreds of leagues, leaving it desolate and ashen in their wake, scoured of life, and with none but the rot gutted carrion vultures that circled above to witness their passing. Hard by the northeastern edge of the shard back mountains, where the rust red hills rose for many leagues, the horde of Tamokan faced its first true battle. Here the feared orcs of the withered eye, frenzied and primitive, tainted by warpstone dust and shunned even by their own kind for their wanton savagery, stood before the horde. Unafraid, although vastly outnumbered, the hulking greenskins streamed from the hills, their obsidian axes held high, braying and howling in their battle lust, their malformed boars grunting and snarling in bloodlust, while their shaman spat curses from behind crude copper masks. The orc tribe and Tamakan's marauder vanguard met in a single great annihilating clash, and all was butchery and bloodshed. Barbed black iron spears pierced orc hide. Clouds of crude fletched arrows felled rank after rank of snarling warriors and screaming horses, as fury was met with fury. Torn from the air, Gulgrog, the orc warboss that was master over the withered eye tribe, and his ravaged wyvern mount fell like a tattered comet to the ground, streaming a trail of ichor, rent asunder by the iron claws of Corason, the chaos dragon of Orbul Vipergut, and as their leader was smashed apart on the rocks, the orcs wavered and faltered, just as Tamokan led the warriors of the main column into the fray. Like a storm tide, the horde washed over the orcs and ground them into the stony dust, and they were but the first of many armies to be destroyed by the horde of the Maggot Lord. Their battle won, the horde set about the bodies of the fallen greenskins. The orc flesh was tough and foul, but welcome, and the horde cast down the rough-hewn idols of the twin orc gods, Gork and Mork, and raised up huge mounds of clean-picked carcasses in their wake. Capped with icons and symbols, dedicating the slaughter to the dark gods of chaos, and there was much rejoicing in the horde. After the hordes passing through the region, Tamakan's pestilential acolytes poisoned and tainted the wells with their own filth, thus ensuring death to any that drank from them in times to come. The great horde carved its scourging path down along the eastern flank of the great range of mountains journeying further south than any within had ever seen. Laying all before it unto waste, the horde pressed ever onwards at the urging of its tainted master, who shouted rasping exhortations to his followers from atop his colossal mount. Beneath the fabled hanging ruins of many-storied Urgrit they passed, the rubble of the shattered towers of the fortress of the dawning world, circling and crashing together above their heads while the cerulean lightning played between the broken sky ruins in an endless dance of insane destruction. The horde carried on into the thorn-thick footfalls of Shamash, where crooked-backed and goatish beastmen and their grotesque minotaur kin slunk from the dark places and fell in with the horde. The brave shaman and gore chiefs of these 
Twisted children of chaos, long bitter enemies of both the ogre kingdoms of the mountains beyond and the celestial empire to the east, offered much lore of the lands before the horde and sought the death of their enemies as a boon from their new lord. But uh, the gods called to Tamakan, and he would not stray from his path. Instead, the beastmen were swept along on Tamokan's course, but leapt upon any chance to raid their ancestral foes. So it was that while the main force of the Horde tramped on southwards at the mountain's edge, the beastmen, allied with the forces of Sal the Faithless, when his side columns split from the Horde's path to seek out the Tower of Ashir, a watchtower and outpost of far Cathay amid the Stonelands. Long had Sal heard of the ancient power of the men beyond the Great Bastion, and he hungered to plunder their secrets. Choosing to seek his own power for a while, he led his followers in an assault against them. The Jade Green Tower, a thing as much of magic as stone, sat high and all but unassailable, upon a jagged promontory of rock overlooking the ancient silk road that led from the gates of the great bastion to the southeast and the inhospitable mountain passes of the ogre kingdoms to the west. From here, the servants of the eternal dragon emperor surveyed the great road and kept watch for signs and portents of woe and threats from distant lands, and so they were well forewarned of the terrors arrayed against them. The warriors of the east, oath sworn and stalwart, stood firm behind the ramparts of the tiered fortifications that encircled the outpost beneath the tower, lined as they were with snarling-mouthed bronze cannon and deadly stone-fleshed temple dogs and crowmen, ready to crush the foe in their granite claws. Weary of the arts and devices of this unfamiliar enemy, Sarl's twisted tongue worked upon the chieftains of the beastmen and convinced them to commence the assault with a night attack, a tactic at which they were expert and well suited. The faithless one's own forces, notably including a dozen war mammoths he had worked loose from the main column for the attack, he planned to keep in reserve until a gap in the defences was breached for them to exploit. From the beginning, the attack went awry for the forces of chaos, and as the braying, savage tide of gores and ungores, minotaurs and spawn erupted from the darkness, the skies above them were riven by explosions of lambent green and ice-white light, as enchanted fireworks turned the night into a rippling phantasm of spectral figures which turned and roared in crazed display. Cannon spat forth clusters of bronze javelins, which showered through the onrushing beastmen, accompanied by wave after wave of barbed crossbow bolts, which fell hundreds in mere moments. The fury of the beasts of chaos, however, did not falter, and within minutes, the barbarous tide, loping and running with phenomenal speed, had reached the outer walls, and spurred on by the whips and cries of their beast lords and bray shaman, scores began to scale the high wall of the outer bastion, their clawed hands and crude picks finding purchase, augmented by the sudden rampant growth of twisted black vines, mutated by the incantations of the shaman. At the outer gate, hulking, multi-armed Gorgon pounded at the gates with petrified tree trunks as hard as iron, only to fall back maimed and dying as dragon-blooded Shungengen hurled blasts of white fire and blizzards of murderous ice shards against them. Heedless of their losses, the Bray herd pressed on, and by sheer reckless fury overwhelmed the outer wall, spilling over it as a storm-driven tide breaks over a levee wall. The warriors of the east stood their ground, though vastly outnumbered, their emerald green back banners flickering in the gaudy light from above their long blades of thousand-folded iron weaving and cutting a red dance through the rough flesh and snarling jaws of the cloven-hoofed ones. But it was not enough, and one by one the Caffean bannermen fell. The fortified compound beneath the tower was taken. The Bray herd, screaming and howling its triumph, and gorging itself frenziedly on the flesh of the dead. 
Sal the Faithless watched on from atop his war mammoth mount, but no matter the entreatments of his Dolgan chieftains and the exalted champions that followed his banner, Sal held them back and would not attack. The warriors and marauders muttered and grew angry at the glory denied them, the victory they were forced to watch, given to the hands of others, to the beastmen no less. But they held back yet, for Sal had promised to feed the souls of any that defied him to the reapers of the void, and such threats all knew were far from idle in nature, and so the Dolgans kept their place grudgingly and did not rush to reinforce the attack. Like knows like, and so it was that Sal felt the twisted skein of magic being drawn tight, and the etheric winds drawn in an ever-intensifying vortex by the blood spilled before him, pulled into a deadly pattern by a will other than his own. Suddenly, at the height of the beastman's bloody revelry in the fortress compound at the foot of the tower, the glowing phantasms in the sky above were snuffed out into deepest black, a black into which a single bright burning star was born. Screaming aloud, Sal and the other chaos sorcerers present sought frantically to adjure the doom that was about to befall the battlefield, but to no end. Sal, knowing bitterly that even as he tried to disrupt the magics that had been wielded, he had little chance of undoing what had been set in motion. The comet fell from the heavens like a speeding bolt of blue-white fire, the burning rune of celestial magic graven upon its flanks in flickering starlight for all with the art to see it. It struck dead centre on the fortress compound with a roaring blast that shook the earth and a blinding flash of power that caused even the war mammoths to buck and bellow in pain. Inside the fortress, all was carnage, as scores of beastmen and minotaurs were incinerated in an instant, gone to ash and dust, with only their shadows blasted against the walls to mark the sudden agony of their passing. The surviving Bray herd reeled, blinded and burned in the wake of the thunderbolt from the heavens, but were given no respite as the baleful counterattack was launched. Strange creatures of living stone swam down the jade walls of the tower and up through the rocky ground as if it were water, and the beastmen became their prey. Encircled and trapped, the Bray herd's savagery was soon overwhelmed, and Sal watched on in grim fascination with his witch's sight as great minotaurs were dragged bellowing and helpless into the air by living statues of onyx, neither raven nor man in shape, and gutted by glittering talons while fresh bannermen, their long blades and wickedly curved pole-arms flashing, poured from the tower gates and into the fray. Bitter and angry that his prize was so readily slipping from his grip, Sal raised mighty magics of his own and sent hurricane winds and spiteful arcs of lightning to vex the enemy and blast and scatter its winged avengers, but could do little more than cover the surviving beastmen's rout from the walls. With a scornful sweep of his clawed hand, Sal signalled the retreat from the tower, and his Dolgans, resentful but cowed by the hurricane storm that now blanketed the tower unabated, obeyed him. Sal had come to Ashishir seeking the power of the East, and he had not been disappointed in the demonstration, but was now left with the humiliation of retreat to rancour at his tainted soul. He swore a vengeance that would be many decades yet in the fruition, but for now had Tamokan to answer to, for having spent thousands of the Bray herd for little gain, save for wisdom. And answer he did before the paragon of the Chaos Host. The great horde of Tamokan, the Maggot Lord, moved ever onwards, on into the bleak lands that bordered the darkly storied ghost fells. Ragged upland moors and desolate foothills, many leagues and expanse that flanked the eastern side of the ancient lands of the giants. The mountains, higher and more primordial even than the fabled mountains of Morn, dominated the horizon. These peaks, or the sky titan's rack, are known in certain dark texts of chaos lore, although long history has given them many names to wear. 
It was these lands that Tamarkan sought to penetrate, there to find the tools for his future conquest of the Empire of Man, as he had foreseen in the blighted visions given him in the Chaos Realm. In his haste and pride, Tamarkan sought to cross the Ghost Fells to reach them sooner, rather than venture south to the vitrified black deserts that separated the southern mountains from Great Cathay, where the Ivory Road passes, a realm with its own manifold dangers, but preferred by the wise to walking in the shadows of the benighted fells. The ghost fells themselves proved no small obstacle to pass, for these were two the remains of empires and dark realms gone asunder in ages past. Here the dead rested only fitfully in their graves, and palely glowing murder grass that rose to bloom in the night was a natural poison to all life that it cut with its ghostly fronds. Worse still, the presence of the great horde thundering and ravaging its way across the hills seemed to awake every peril and malign will that slumbered there, and it was as if the very earth beneath their feet rebelled against them. For the first time, was the horde truly slowed, and was forced by the terrain to break up into hundreds of smaller channels, like the tributaries of a great river. Their passage was plagued by phantoms and baleful fires upon the road, sucking pits of corpse-strewn bog that seemed to snap around men and horses like waiting beasts, and splintered, crag-strewn paths that turned back upon themselves without warning. Strange, cloying mists of maddening thickness rose up and faded again without rhyme or reason, and entire war bands and hunting parties, hundreds strong, went missing without trace in the mazes of rock. Now more mundane, but no less threatening danger also soon presented itself, and no meat or water could be found that proved safe to consume in this malign wilderness, even for the disease-churned stomachs of Nurgle's followers, threatening starvation for the Horde. Soon dissent whispered that Tamarkan had brought them to a place of evil sorcery he did not comprehend, and ancient chaos lore found echoes in the stories of hulking shapes lurking in the mist, their misshapen forms crowned each with a single burning eye. Against the rising discord in the host, Tamarkan and his chieftains instilled order by the lash and bloody reprisal the dissenters and the weak, proving welcome provisions for the horde's many hungry bellies. Unwavering, Tamakan pressed them on relentlessly, refusing to be balked or stay to give battle to a foe he could neither see nor grasp, until the ghost fells were at their backs and the mountains loomed vast and snow-capped before them. After much travail, the ancient lands of the giants beckoned. The horde... A few thousand dark sworn souls fewer than before it had stepped into the accursed ghost fells, entered the high valleys of the mountains, battling through sudden rockfalls and freezing gales, and cut into the ivory road deep in the high country. Following the road, it turned south and west into a great rift valley that held the ruins of one of the fabled cities of the Sky Titans. Here, Cyclopean pillars of granite soared as high as the mountains about them, once the foundation stones of cities that had towered in the skies above. Wild and lush growth had long since overcome the cracked pavings and broken rubble that had tumbled down from the fallen sky castles, and game, huge and primal, rhinoxen, razor tusk, stonehorn and dire elk were abundant, as was fresh water and the horde soon flooded out to despoil all before it and dispel the shadow of hunger and thirst it had endured. The horde paused for the first time since the gallows tree and made a vast sprawling series of encampments in the shadows of the gargantuan ruins, allowing for the first time a period of rest and recovery. Already it had travelled thousands of leagues in a span of time impossibly short by mere mortal reckoning. But where the will of chaos was concerned, such likes accounted little. The weak and the ill-fortuned had fallen by the wayside, and the chosen strong and faithful endured. Great altars were raised up to the chaos gods, each to its desire and measure, and celebrations were held of sacrifice, morbidity, 
slaughter and debauchery, as was pleasing to each fane's patron, demons dancing in the shadows of the celebrant's fires. The arrival of so great a horde, still tens of thousands strong in this savage and half-forgotten land, had not gone unnoticed. Giants dwelled here still, in an abundance not seen elsewhere. Man-like creatures, bone-grinders and foe-crushers, colossal in stature, steeple-tall, slow-witted but bellicose, and with a hunger to match their size. Now, on the fringes of the horde, the giants gave battle, each the match of a hundred men, bellowing and smashing, marauder and spawn beast alike, to bloody ruin with chunks of ancient masonry, hurled down from the high crags, or rampaging through them like a maddened boar through a sheepfold. Legend had it, that it had been the giant's forebears, mightier in both strength and mind, that had built the now fallen cities and prospered here long ago, when the world was young and fought with ancient empires now gone to dust, fading first into an isolated echo of their past glories before the ogres came from the east and sundered their once unconquered realm forever. Giants Tamakan had of his own, mutated and savage, scions of the high crags of the chaos wastes, but they were too few to serve his purpose. Tamakan's order was simple, and it brooked no disobedience save on pain of death. The attacking giants were not to be slain, but taken alive, subdued either by brute force or sorcery he cared not, only that they were gathered before him. Those he could not gather by force, he opted for other means to ensnare, and so sent, often unwilling, emissaries to tempt and coerce them. Not by threat, for giants by nature care little for such things, and answer only with violence, but with promises of abundant meat and strong spirits to slack their thirst, and of battlefields yet to come filled with spoil and plunder. Others were baited with poisoned caresses, tainted with the sickening philtres of Slaneshi cultists, which drugged them as helpless as a babe to be taken while others heard the bestial song of the Bray Shaman and so were lost to the fathomless black fever dream of the Bray Herd. Within a moon's turning, near on a hundred giants had been taken into the host, some willingly, others bound in chains of foul sorcery. The irreplaceable coin of the arcane binding scroll, gifted to him by the unclean hag, spent in submitting them to Tamakan's will. Of the ogres and their domains. Ogres are hulking, brutish creatures, human-like in many ways, but savage beyond what little reason they possess, and filled with tremendous hunger not easily satiated. Each ogre warrior, and all of their kind, hunt and make war in some manner, and to them there is little distinction between the two. Stands nearly twice the height of a man, and half again as broad. Only a fool would take their great girth for soft fat. Instead, it is hard muscle, tough hide and insulation that protects them from the ravages of cold and climate. Their strength is prodigious, and they can snap human bones like matchwood with little effort, and their jaws can crush and devour even stone and metal, it is reckoned, although meat, juicy, red and dripping, is by far their favoured fare. For ogres, might makes right, and they are dominated by the largest and most violent among them, forming petty tyrannies and tribes that war and bicker amongst themselves for food and for the simple joy of battle. The ogre kingdoms lie far to the east of the old world and the civilised lands of the west, beyond even the desolation of the dark lands which lie on the other side of the expanse of the world's edge mountains. Here, within the numberless crags and valleys of the foreboding and primal mountains of Morn, the tribes of the ogres have made their home since migrating here after the coming of the Great Moor, their destroyer and god, who ravaged their ancestral lands on the borderlands of Far Cathay. It is an immense, wild and wind-swept country, whose climate is harsh and cold, and it is the abode of all manner of strange and terrible beasts, against which the ogres happily make war, hunt for food, and subdue as beasts of battle or burden. At its eastern flank can be found the shattered and often unquiet ruins of ancient civilizations and dead realms, which even the ogres believe are best left undisturbed. 
He erred in the ogre kingdoms, and ogre tyrant often rules, as far as he may see, in practical terms of valley or high pass, by strength and fear. And while undeniably savage and brutish, the best, or worst, perhaps, of them possess a certain cunning and intelligence that sees them open to extorting tribute and captives from rivals and trade caravans alike for protection, often from their own followers. Many tribes allow the sub-race of the greenskins called nobblers to fetch and carry for them, and trade with them such baubles and plunder as they might take, the better to acquire things they hold in true value, which is weapons and more meat, i.e. captives. Indeed, mercenary ogres are a far from uncommon sight in other lands, where they ply their bloody trade for gold and food. These ogres, sometimes known as man-eaters, are valued and dreaded in equal measure, and when the high crags and valleys of the ogre kingdoms become too full with their own kind, they march on other realms to appease their hunger, and the lands of men and orcs tremble to the footsteps of this monstrous race on the march. Time soon became the enemy, for as powerful as the will and desires of the Horde were, they were as nothing compared to the primordial power of the mountains of Morn to the west that they must cross. And now, in the dying of the year, already the high mountains sowed the signs of a dire and spiteful winter drawing close, and even the plentiful game within the wide valley was thinning at the Horde's hunger. The ivory road west was the path the great Horde would take, and the only pass of accessible to so great a number as they were the mountains. It was also a pass that would see them walk through the Ogre Kingdoms and through the heart of Greasus Goldtooth's realm, over tyrant of the Ogres. The warriors and Chaos Champions of the Horde were eager to see battle against so worthy and strong a foe whose fame had reached even to the northern wastes, and Tamakan was content to smash his way through the Ogre Kingdoms if need be, conquering and destroying all for the glory of the Dark Gods. Bargaining also, that if he could slay the Overtyrant, many of the bloodthirsty and mercenary ogre tribes would flock to his banner themselves after such a display of strength. Strange fates were instead to play Tamakan a fool, and see his plans to ruin, when his outriders reported that the road ahead into the Mountains of Morn ended in an impassable wall of rock, the dusty path simply cut off as if severed by an axe blade. Tamakan ranted and raged at the folly of his servants and slew those who brought such news to his flint skin tent. At his behest he drove the horde on until he was forced to confront the truth himself, where the wide pass had been since time immemorial, was now no more than the sheer and crooked crags of the mountainside. So denied, he believed the feat some illusion wrought of magic, but his sorcerers could not detect it, let alone undo any great spellcraft. Indeed, those who sent their wills on the winds of magic to uncover the truth recoiled at the cold and hungry touch of something older and darker than mere mortal magic, and Sal the Faithless whispered in the ear of those that would hear him that the spirits of the mountains laughed at Tamakan and scorned the vanity of his presumption. Descent again reared its head, and brawling and bloody combat broke out between those who served the Maggot Lord directly and shared his faith, and those who followed other fell masters, and Tamakan himself took to the fight, aback the mighty toad dragon Bubolus, in order to restore order, grinding those who would gainsay him under his mount's clawed feet. It was the dragon rider Orbal, who had flown far and braved the wrath of ice wymes and winged manticores in the frozen heights in order to scout a fresh path for the horde, that espied a route out of the valleys which now seemed to threaten to enclose on Tamokan and his host, like the jaws of a trap. Far to the south, the broken valley walls gave through a narrow, high-sided ravine to a wide plateau of rock, which itself sunk in its outer reaches towards endless hills of lifeless grey, and a wide stagnant river flowing westward from a soot-black lake. 
But to reach this breach in the mountains, the ravine must first be crossed, and as Orbel intoned, its high crags were studded with tattered banners and trophy skulls, each marked with the signs of the great moor and a gore-covered fist. As he had drawn close, the stirrings of bulky figures could be seen in the caves above the ravine, and he was met with volley upon volley of great iron-shot bolts hurled from concealed war engines, some fitted with grappling barbs and great chains to drag him down. Ogres awaited the horde in force, and were arrayed in strength, where in the narrow pass the horde's numbers would count for little against such determined and brutal resistance. Yet there was no other path to take where the horde could march as one. There was no choice. The plan to cross the mountains of Morn via the Ivory Road would have to be abandoned, and a new road carved. Tamakan roused his chieftains and commanders and told them his will. The horde marched south. From the first day's march southwards, the host's progress was watched by those who made their homes in the high mountains. These were the lands of the ogres, fierce, brutal creatures intolerant of trespassers and long accustomed to preying upon intruders into their domains and battling against the myriad of strange beasts that inhabited the mountains of Morn and against would-be invaders, humans, greenskin and worse. The High Pass South was under the control of the infamous and intractable Red Fist tribe, one of the strongest ogre kingdoms in the southern mountains, held in the iron fist grip of the ogre tyrant Karaka Break Mountain, a warlord whose prodigious strength had seen his fame spread among his own kind and was possessed of a certain low cunning, not uh, commonly found in his dull-witted kin. The Red Fist would not stand by and allow the horde of Tamaka and Bai without a fight, and a heavy price in blood would have to be paid. When the Horde's vanguard reached the defile between two mountain peaks that marked the entrance to the ravine pass, the Kurgan riders found their progress barred by a hastily constructed wall of boulders and broken stones. The dry, thorny brush under their mount's hooves was peppered with man-traps and other vicious snares. As they approached closer to the barrier, they were pelted with rocks and bombarded with huge spears and volleys of scrap thrown from the pinnacle above, and were soon thrown back in disarray. Heavier forces were immediately brought up, the steel-sheathed chaos warriors of Alvis Hurl, the howling cultists of the Pox Mantle, and even screeching waves of impossibly mutated war-spawn, driven on by the goads of their flesh-masters and sent into paroxysms of savagery by hellish pipes of demons. None, though, could force the passage. Though the horde of Tamukan outnumbered the ogres that balked them perhaps a hundred to one, the narrowness of the defile made it impossible for the Chaos Horde to bring more than a few score of warriors into battle at a time. The fighting raged for several hours without making any apparent dent in the ogre's defences, as each fresh charge was met by a solid wall of hulking muscle and iron. Soon, the pass before the defile was heaped so high with bodies that they threatened to rise above the deceptively crude barrier the ogres had raised, and beady-eyed noblars, the degenerate race of greenskins that served the ogres, were soon frantically scoring the corpse piles and using armoured bodies and whatever else solid they could find to make the barrier higher, even while the battle thundered around them. Tamukan raged again at the delay. Although unlike the impassive mountains that had barred his progress to the north, this was an enemy he could get to grips with and destroy. He had observed the fighting from a high shelf of rock that overlooked the battle from behind the horde's line of attack and learned much. Every time his warriors appeared to be about to breach the wall, a huge and fierce ogre chieftain, a creature whose immense girth outmatched even the brutes around him, would rush into the gap and immediately turn the tide of battle against the horde. A great pile of chaos champions and their warriors now lay dead about the ogre tyrant's feet, and his bodyguard... Thick-skinned brutes bearing huge, black cleavers bellowed defiantly and smeared their fists with the blood and ichor of their victims. Observing this contemptuous behaviour, Tamakan vowed that it would be he that slew the tyrant personally. Forming up his own warband of decaying and corrupt Nurgle sons, 
He directed the efforts of his sorcerers against the makeshift fortification closest to where the ogre tyrant stood. Soon, the corresponding portion of the barrier lay in shattered ruins, its stones broken and pulverised by sorcerous blasts. The air hung heavy with smoke and foul fumes, and before the dust cleared, Tamakan urged his mighty steed forward. Bubolus, the greatest of toad dragons, roared its challenge and charged the war. The mountain shook, and the sound of shattering rocks and splintered stone reverberated around the canyon. From the high pinnacle above, a fresh wave of spears and broken blades showered down against the filth-stained tide that ran headlong towards the breach, bellowing joyful war cries in rasping, disease-racked voices. Sorcerers hurled their shrieking spells, and the ogre butchers answered with their own guttural incantations until the air boiled with the passage of dark magic, and the mountain shook with the thunder of a thousand iron-shod feet in deafening clamour. Boulders dislodged by the bombardment tumbled from the mountainside and plunged upon the armies below. Huge stones bounded down the narrow valley, crushing and burying warriors from both sides, and soon the air grew so thick with dust it hid the sun and cast the steep-sided defile into near darkness. Near, unseen as ghosts in the choking dust, the warriors of Tamakan, the Maggot Lord, smashed into the barrier breach in a blind whirlwind of hacking, screaming carnage until the corpse mounts shifted and toppled and the barrier crumbled. In the confusion, both sides smashed and trampled foe and friend alike underfoot, and after minutes that seemed an eternity, the lines parted, reeling away from each other, neither yet broken, although the ravine was now carpeted in the dead and the dying. At last, the shrieks of magic ceased, and the echoes of devastation slowly stilled, but for the agonised cries of the maimed and mutilated. In the cloud of dust... A vast shape took form and began to lurch purposely forward. From the gloom emerged the warty head of Bubolus, followed by the toad dragon's vast, festering body. The bloated creature's rotting scales dripped and spat as he heaved his gargantuan carcass over the stony ground. Tamakan, the maggot lord, surveyed the spectral scene from his high seat upon the broad haunches of the gigantic monstrosity. Before his foes knew what was upon them, Bubolus was in their midst. The monster's enormous bulk easily pushed aside the few remaining boulders and toppled what little was left of the ogre's crude barrier. The mighty creature raised its warty head, opened its tusked maw, and spewed a vast liquid cloud of foulness that stripped the bubbling flesh from the dozen ogre balls caught before it and sent a dozen more stumbling over themselves in a panic flight to escape. A terrible, rank stench rose from Bubolus's rancid body and the dissolving remains of its victims. Few, if any, could stand before such a terror, and even the savage ogres seemed momentarily stunned. But ogres are wont to feast upon the rankest flesh, and they quickly regrouped to stand their ground. At their head stood the ogre chieftain, whose broad-headed axe near a cartwheel size in span, had already slain so many of Tamokan's mightiest warriors that day. Bigger than his fellows by a head or more, Karaka Brake Mountain raised his blood-drenched axe and bellowed defiantly, his warband rallying to the tyrant's defiance to take up the cry. Soon, the whole ogre army, which moments before had been all but ready to flee, turned to face their enemy to fight once more. Tamakan snarled as the ogre tyrant hurled insults at him in the dark tongue, and their eyes met with a flicker of unquenchable hatred. The ogre stepped forwards and bellowed a challenge in the coarse guttural tongue of chaos, daring Tamakan to face him in person rather than let the toad dragon fight his battles for him. Tamakan's pride rankled at the barb, and even though Bubolus might have easily trampled the ogre into the dirt and been done with the foe, Tamakar knew that the eyes of his own warriors and champions were upon him, and that they too had understood the tyrant's words. Cunning indeed was this ogre amongst his kind. He would not show weakness. 
And what was this brute compared to the power of one favoured by the rotting blessings of Father Nurgle, he thought. Drawing his dark-edged rune blade, Tamakan slipped down from the toad dragon's back and prepared to meet his enemy's challenge, while behind him the Chaos host rasped and bellowed its approval. The two armies drew back as Tamakan and the Ogre Tyrant approached one another. They began to circle, each looking for an opening to launch its attack. The great ogre towered above Tamakan, and the cadaverous Chaos Lord in his rusted finery seemed impossibly fragile in comparison. Yet not even an ogre could fail to recognise the power of Nurgle's chosen champion, and approached his foe wearily. The ogre was the first to strike, hefting a wide swing with his axe, and Tamakan darted out of reach with derisory ease, only to be caught almost flat-footed when, with unforeseen skill, the ogre reversed the blow and sent the axe's brass pummel flying at the centre of Tamakan's head with murderous force. Tamakan barely rolled with the impact, which sundered his helm and reposted with a savage series of stabs against his hulking enemy's exposed flesh. The combatants parted, both sporting wounds, and the battle was joined in earnest. The great axe swung in deadly arcs while Tamakan's rune blade spat and hummed as it slashed and stabbed at his foe, and all around them Ogre and Chaos Warrior alike shouted and bellowed for their champion's victory. Minutes passed and both were bleeding and battered, neither having gained the upper hand. But Tamakan saw his opportunity when his foe's axe blade, striking downwards, was momentarily caught in the armoured breastplate of a fallen Chaos Knight. Screaming a prayer to his dark patron, Tamakan thrust his dark blade swiftly as an arrow straight towards the ogre's eye and sank it point deep into the monster's head. The ogre staggered back clumsily, dropping his axe and waving his arms jerkily about as if fending off an irate wasp, but did not fall, and Tamakan lunged in to deliver the killing blow. But Karaka Break Mountain was far from dead. Bellowing in rage, the tyrant charged his enemy with a shocking burst of speed. His great armoured belly slammed into the Chaos Lord and smashed him sprawling and stunned to the ground. Tamakan rolled to his left, as a moment later the tyrant's body slammed into where he had lain. Stunned and reeling, Tamakan staggered to his feet, broken bones grinding together inside his withered body but could not escape as the ogre caught hold of Tamakan by the shoulder and shoved him hard upon the ground. A deep moan came from the Chaos host as they saw their master fall. Now the ogre stood astride Tamakan, and with both hands, fists tore the room blade from his hand and snapped it asunder. It then grasped the Chaos Lord's upraised arm and snapped it off at the elbow, as a man at a feast might tear the wing from a roasted fowl. Tamakan's maimed arm waggled back and forth, as if he were attempting to fend his enemy off with a limb that was no longer there. The tyrant made a breathless noise that might have been a hollow laugh, but as he did so, a gout of black and crimson liquid fountained from Tamakan's severed stump and struck the creature full in the face. The ogre roared and wiped his eyes, but the foul liquid was not blood. It was a torrent of writhing grave worms. The ogre staggered back and clawed at his eyes and mouth, pulling away great handfuls of the vile worms that even now burrowed into the open wounds in his face. Jerking to his knees like a puppet with severed strings, Tamakan tore off his ruined helm, and from behind the mask of flesh, the maggot lord's true form emerged. Behind him, the body of the Chaos Lord he had stolen on the killing fields of Zambajan lay as nothing but a crumbled and empty shell, like the sloth skin of a serpent. The maggot thing uncoiled and leapt at the thrashing tyrant, and in a second had bored into the soft flesh of the ogre's exposed throat. The tyrant, toppling backwards like a felled tree. The greatest warriors of Chaos are favoured by the gods like no other race. Such favours often give them near-demonic powers, unimaginable to other mortals. Yet even so, the sight of Tamakan's destruction and that of his enemy was no common thing. 
All who watched stood in awed silence as the sky above them darkened a fetid green, and the field of corpses began to twitch with blooming rot and steamed with noxious amber vapours. The tyrant's huge body seemed to churn and pulse, and the ogre's skin rippled back and forth a while, like waves upon the sea, then stilled as if some conflict had been won. Tamakan, the maggot lord, opened his eyes and gasped in huge gulps of air, filling the ogre's ravaged lungs as if for the first time like a newborn beast. He rose up, standing on broad feet upon squat muscular legs, and stood a little unsteadily. For a while he flexed his arms and stretched the huge muscles either side of his thick neck. Gradually he gained his balance. He took a step forward, and as he did so there was a mighty roar from the Chaos host. As for the ogres, some had already begun to flee, scaling the rocks and crags with surprising speed, while others fought on, but were soon overwhelmed. Many of the Red Fist tribe were confused by this strange turn of events. Was this creature still their leader? Or was it now the destroyer? Some were simply awed by the Maggot Lord's victory, but in any case they knelt in submission to a new and terrible master. Tamakan then picked up the broken remains of his black blade from the ground. How tiny it seemed in his monstrous hands. He tossed it aside and instead took up the tyrant's axe and held it aloft as all around him the great horde roared in victory and he too bellowed his triumph in a brute voice that was now Tamokan's own. The way to the west was his. The Chaos Dwarves Malign, dark-souled and merciless, the Dwari Zar, or Chaos Dwarves as they are known in legend, to the other peoples of the world are a warrior race of demonsmiths and craftsmen, slavers and brutal killers who dominate the northern reaches of the Darklands and have done for thousands of years. Long separated from their fading kin of the West, the Chaos Dwarves have given themselves over to their Dark Master, and Chaos has worked subtle changes on their bodies, slowly mutating even the notoriously resilient dwarven physiology, inflicting twisting terrors on their minds and souls, so that they have become a spite-filled and calculatingly cruel reflection of what they once were. The most extreme examples of this change can be found amongst the sorcerer prophets and demon smiths who rule them, who must pay a heavy price for the power they gain from their dark god, and the grotesque and murderously bestial bull centaurs, mutated beyond almost all recognition and unmatched in savagery. The centre of their power is Mingulzar Nagrund, the city of fire and desolation. It is a place of unimaginable suffering for the countless slaves of other races they use to fuel the burning of their ceaseless industry and to appease the appetites of their nightmarish god, Hashut, the father of darkness. Their empire has come to encompass the vast fire-scorched volcanic plain of Zarduk, at the heart of which Zar Nagrand sits, and delves deep below the surface, taking in countless miles of cavernous magma-lit delvings, furnace chambers and hellish mineworks. For many miles around the plain of Zar has succumbed to the hand of the Chaos Dwarves, and it is littered with the scars of vast open mines, fiery rivers of lava, ash dunes, and stagnation pools of foaming yellow and blood, red, alchemical spoil, worse than the foulest natural poison. Far from dying away, the Chaos Dwarf Empire is slowly and steadily expanding its influence, and maintains several major outposts and fortified citadels in the southern Darklands, most notably the Tower of Gorgoth, and the Black Fortress, although none could truly claim dominion over the shifting, desolate landscape of the Darklands, nor its monstrous inhabitants. Unlike other dwarves, the Chaos Dwarves are deeply learned in the sorcerous arts, and have become obsessed with the control of hellish forces and the fires of the Deep Earth, combining the dark lore they have gleaned with an artisanship and skill for metalwork and industry, undimmed from their ancient past. This has produced a bewildering variety of strange and infernal war engines, demon-bound weapons, and deadly tools of war, 
many of which they have long traded for resources and captives to the chaos-worshipping tribes of the northern wastes, but the greatest of their creations they have jealously guarded for themselves, and so decade after decade their power has grown. Deep within the Darklands, shielded by deadly mountain ranges and set amid desolation and the horns of monstrous beasts, the Empire of the Chaos Dwarves has faded into legend to many in the Old World, but those forced to confront their implacable black ironclad armies and savage engines know the truth. The day may yet come when the armies of dread Tsar Nagrand march forth in force to crush the world beneath their heels. Chapter 3 Tamokan looked out upon the blasted land and the shadow of the great and ashen fortress and growled impatiently through his ruined jaws. The horde was at last breaking camp and moving out once more on its bloody course. Half a year's turning had passed since the Battle of the High Crags had broken open the way to the west for Tamokan and that span of time had wrought great changes upon both the ogre body he wore and the horde at his command. The pack the Maggot Lord had long since sealed with his foul master Nurgle carried many strictures and boons, boons which to others would be no more than nightmarish torture and sickening debasement, but to one devoted to the god of decay and disease were instead signs of favour and divine grace. Tamakan's filth shaman had declared the alignment of the stars and the passage of Morsleep, the Black Moon of Chaos, to be particularly auspicious, and had suspended the Horde's progress for a time at the foot of the mountains. Here, in a verdant and all but untouched valley, the twisted devotees of plague had formed Tamakan's inner circle, had sunk a befouled pit in the earth in which terrible rites were enacted night after night to the glory of Nurgle and the land for leagues around became wasted and tainted, and all that walked or crawled or grew in that place sickened and died, if it was fortunate, and those that were less fortunate became host to the most malignant and cancerous mutation, or the playthings of demons, and in either case he did their new master's call. Those of the Horde that did not share Nurgle's faith steered well clear of the noisome encampment of their leader at this time, and instead roamed the hill country nearby, foraging and culling the primal beasts that roamed the hills for meat, setting up store for the arduous and bleak lands they knew lay ahead. It was testament to the favour that the Dark Gods had shown Tamokan, that when the year began to wane they returned once more to his banner when called, although reluctantly for the most part, the lure of glory to come still weighed favourably with the Kurgan. The winter had seen the Chaos Host make its way along the Grey River through league after league of rolling barren hills, caught between the mountains to the north and the trackless haunted forest to the south. They had battled their way through teeming nobler swarms, gigantic black scorpions the size of watchtowers, and a score of brutal ogre tribes, which had to be broken, driven off, or overmatched in turn. Although given more open battlefields than before, none ever posed the threat that the Red Fist tribe had. The battles had been glorious, and the ogres a worthy foe, and many of the warriors of Chaos had seen transfiguration and blessing in the eyes of the Chaos gods for their prowess and death toll. While others dealt a fickler hand by the Dark Fates, now replenished the ranks of the warspawn that thronged around the beast-born shrines to the chaos gods at the centre of the host. By the time the horde of the Maggot Lord had reached where the great and polluted river ruin cut across their path from north to south, marking the borders of the fabled Darklands, perhaps a little more than half of the original Kurgan warriors that had gathered to Tamakan's banners after the great battle of Zamjiban remained. His force, though, still numbered in the many thousands, and beastmen and giants now added to the ranks, as did ogres, many of whom had taken on a terrible aspect. It had pleased Tamakan to bring those of the Red Fist tribe that had bowed before him, now he wore their dead tyrant's body, close into his circle, and he assuaged their hunger with gifts of the foulest and most decaying and corrupted meat, thus inducting them into the ways of the great plague father. 
The change upon them had been profound, and mutation was rife. Even these creatures, so usually resistant to the touch of chaos, could not help but succumb to so concentrated and malignant a corruption. Whole regiments of plague ogres now fought alongside Tamokan, whose own stolen flesh had bloomed and rotted in turn, his features no more than a sagging, ruined mass, while a single twisted and pustulant horn had sprung from his crown. It was this bloated and decaying figure, mounted as ever aback Bubolus, the Toad Dragon, that had confronted the Dark Empire of Tsar at the Great River Crossing, over which, like an obsidian dagger thrust into the burning, smoke-laden skies, the black fortress of the Chaos Dwarves stood sentinel. On the opposite bank of the river, across the shallow causeways that were the only place a force as large and unwieldy as Tamakan's horde might cross into the Darklands for many leagues, Lord Drazhoth, the Ashen, master of the Black Fortress, had drawn up his army. Here Tamakan's thousands were matched with rank after rank of compact regimented figures, encased from head to toe in thick ornate armour woven from smouldering steel scales and thick blackened plates. Brutal blades and strange ornate weapons beating a deadly rhythm in unison against brazen shields. All throughout their lines were batteries of nightmarish war engines, demon-fused cannon and gaping-mouthed mortars. At the flanks, great mobs of hobgoblin slave soldiers cowered and fretted under the cruel lashes of their overseers, ready to be spent as living shields of blood and bone for their callous masters. Tamakan knew that he had the power and might to force the crossing, even against the legendary wrath of the Chaos Dwarves of Tsar Nagrond. The sheer fury and monstrous power of the Horde would see to that, but the cost would be high indeed. As for the commander of the defending force, Drazhov knew that he faced a battle of a kind unwitnessed in the lands of Tsar since time immemorial, and his reason calculated the odds poorly in his favour. Yet even in the face of certain defeat, Lord Drazhoth was unafraid, for he was of a race prouder and more stubborn than any upon the face of the world, and thus was his charge and the charge of all those consigned to garrison the mighty black fortress that marked the boundary of the Chaos Dwarf Dominion, to fight and die with the breath of hatred upon their lips against the foes of Tsar Nagrond. Though death and destruction were inevitable, he would not disgrace the Chaos Dwarves of Tsar, nor sell cheaply the legacy of Ashut, his father in darkness. Each, perhaps, had the echo of some other outcome of the confrontation, the mutual destruction in mind from the start, but first both pride and the desire of the Dark Gods must be born. There would be blood. For many hours, the tide of chaos crashed upon the army of the Lords of Ashut, in wave after wave, it advanced upon the thin line of Chaos Dwarfs, only to be beaten back under a hail of arrows and gunfire. Strange missiles leapt from the Chaos Dwarfs' ranks and fell upon their enemies with great resounding crashes like thunder. Warriors and beasts were blown into so many pieces of shredded flesh and mangled iron and burned, the flames charring their flesh, even under the waters of the Black River Ruin. Yet like the tide... The army of Tamokan came on relentlessly. As one warrior fell, another stepped into his place, and soon, by storm and wing beast, the supply trains of the army of Tsar began to come under attack from above. Rotting wing corpse vultures and demon furies struck from the skies, while sorcerous lightning arced down to burn and blast, causing powder kegs to erupt in lethal fireballs, incinerating all around them. The dragon rider Orbal Vipergut led the aerial assault behind the Chaos Dwarf lines, scattering hobgoblin caravan guards and butchering screaming slaves bound in their traces and unable to flee. Soon enough, however, the Chaos Dwarf's guns slowed, and many were struck silent, their ammunition and powder spent. Slowly the horde regrouped to renew the attack, and this time the Dolgan war mammoths were to lead the assault, and behind them, Heavily armoured Chaos Knights and warriors were taking up key positions before the foe. The morning's battle had simply been a preliminary attempt to draw the enemy's fire. The Chaos Dwarves had unknowingly wasted their cannons and powder on the most expendable parts of the horde, 
mutated cultists, wild monsters, savage or mindless spawn, and though so blessed by chaos's corrupting touch, they were glad to seek death rather than live another day. Of course, some sacrifice had been necessary. Thousands of Kurgan lay dead or dying, as well as hundreds of Tamakan's plague ogres. That the path to glory was awash with blood, no one would ever deny. Drazov the Ashen was neither fool nor inexperienced as a general, and saw immediately the peril his forces were in. Swiftly, he commanded a detachment of his infernal guard to hold the line until slain, and ordered his fellow demonsmiths to work with fear and mind-clouding magics to hurl the hobgoblin slave soldiers at their command into the teeth of the foe to delay them while the greater and more valuable Chaos Dwarf Force and its engines of war sought a retreat. The plan, however, did not survive the charge of the ground-shaking war mammoths across the causeway, and even the Infernal Guard could not hold back such a weight of muscle and fury, and the centre of the line on the far bank was shattered in the huge beast's first mighty assault. The retreat became a disarrayed rout, as the weapons of the Kurgan fell mercilessly upon the orcs and hobgoblins who made up the greater part of the slave army, and many more of the cowardly creatures died in the rush to escape, as the panicked hobgoblins fought and clawed over each other in their eagerness to flee. Those not trampled to death by their comrades were simply buried and suffocated in the press. Isolated blocks of chaos dwarves stood their ground rather than face the ignominy of being cut down in flight, both at their war machines and in defensive squares of steel-shod warriors. They fought savagely and bravely, but they stood little chance as the horde washed over them. There was great slaughter on both sides, but soon the victory was Tamokhan's, and Drazov, his demon smiths and the core of his legion made good their retreat covered by great clouds of ash and sulfurous darkness, back to the safety of the Black Fortress. It was Saul the Faithless, he of the twisted flesh and serpent's tongue, that was chosen as emissary in Tamakan's stead to deliver his word to the Chaos Dwarfs, now holed up in their near impregnable fortress, a great hollowed-out and sculpted mountain surrounded by cinder pits where molten magma flowed like water at the whim of its masters. Sal, who had by this time become the de facto, if untrusted, leader of all within the Horde who were not pledged to the Plague Lord, was, some whispered, a far from wise choice, but from Tamakan's view, no less than a quarrelsome if useful tool, and ultimately expendable should the Dwari Zar choose to make a point of destroying him. Tamakan's message to the Chaos Dwarf Lord was thus, Know that I am Tamakan, son of the great Kurgan, master of hosts, bringer of desolation, champion of the Lord of Decay. Speak. Would you, Lord Drashoff, perish knowing that your land will be despoiled and your fortress plundered? By all witness of the dark gods who have fought with honour and brought glory to thy master, now yield without shame. Our war is not with the lords of Hashut, but with the lands of men. Join us. Grant us the blessing of steel, and thy fell arts of war, and the spoils of victory shall fall to all alike. As it has been before between the Kurgan and the sons of Zwar, let it be again, and a pact struck between us. Drazov heard these words and dismissed Tamakan's threat to the Black Fortress as an idle one, and yet all the lands he had sworn to dominate were scourged, ravaged by the wolf now at his door. A calamity his brethren and distant mingles are Nagron would not forgive. But his wicked heart leapt as he thought of the legendary riches of the West, of iron and stone and gemstones, of the plunder of slaves, of gold and flesh and blood. But most of all of the law he might glean. For many years now stories had reached the empire of the Chaos Dwarfs of the powerful battle magic and war engines that had risen in the human lands of the West. Tales spoken of by caravan masters seeking to curry favour and confessions extorted under torture from captives and freshly brought slave stock. No doubt was in Drashoff's mind that these purely human creations would prove inferior to the craftsmanship of the demon smiths of Tsar, but there would be great merit in their measuring. Should he lead an expedition and match the might of his legion against the humans of the West in victory and take their secrets for his own? Then, among Hashut's dark priesthood, 
his star would rise anew, and so the flames of glory to come were fanned in Drasov's cold and spiteful breast. None of this reasoning, the lord of the Black Fortress, allowed to slip before the baleful chaos sorcerer before him. Drasov would ensure the bargain would prove long and arduous before at last a pact was sealed. The Horde marched southwest under the guidance of hobgoblin outriders, where the Horde encamped for three moons at a wide, long disused mine known as Gulakta in the Chaos Dwarf tongue. Here, by bloody battle, as part of their bargain with the Chaos Dwarfs, they drove out the Black Orc tribe that had infested the ruins, and set about ranging far and wide with great slaughter along the scalded delta, sending a steady stream of captives to the Dark Empire to the north. In return, caravans pulled by strange, ash-blackened beasts, and steaming, clanking machines the likes of which no Kurgan had ever seen arrived by night and day at Gulakka, bearing bushels of weapons and darkly forged war gear to re-equip the horde. Without mercy or cease, deep within the bowels of the Black Fortress and the distant tower of Gorgoth, hellish furnaces which burned flesh and soul as much as coal and tinder, blazed and hammered and resounded with sacrificial screams, as under Drashoff's direction preparations were made for the Legion of Asgar and its malevolent engines of war to go west with Tamokan's horde, not as followers, but allies against the chosen foe. The sworn pact was that for the aid of the demon smith's might in bringing down the great city, the Legion of Asgar would in return have their pick of prisoners and battlefield plunder, and then would the bargain be complete. As preparations were made for the journey west, and in honour of the bargain struck, Tamakan and his warriors joined in battle alongside the Legion of Asgar, against one of their most terrible and ancient foes, the dragon Omdra the Dread. This monster of legend had stirred once more, and soon its dominion carried across the northern plain of bones, and its colossal black-winged shadow scattered all before it in nightmare and terror. No mere beast, however great its size, was Omdra, but an ancient and wicked creature with dark magics to match even the vaunted Sal and at whose inhuman will gargantuan moorwimes rose up from the black sands to give battle alongside packs of wanton and hungry crypt ghouls, to whom the dragon was no less than a god, and threw themselves with savage piety against the Kurgan. In this battle were thousands slain, both Kurgan and Chaos Dwarf together, and here did the great Chaos spawn Gathgrak fall. And even mighty Bubolus suffered grievous wounds as the nightmare dragon and its servants ambushed the horde's main column in the dead of night. A great cost in blood and sorcery was the dragon god herself, gravely injured and driven away to slumber beneath the bones of her dead kin, her threat to the desolation of Asgard broken, at least for a time. In return for this effusion of slaughter on their behalf, the servants of Hashut honoured Tamakan with the gift of a war axe fit to his stature, a darkly enchanted blade, to replace the tyrants which had shattered in the granite hard skull of a moorworm in battle. Also, at Tamakan's behest, they took the near hundred giants that still fought with the horde and worked their arts of forge craft and sorcery on them encasing them in plated iron and fitting them with great hook blades and picks, the better to scale and sunder the fortifications the horde must face when it reached its destination. Soon, however, Tamakan grew impatient to move onwards, weary that his horde's numbers were steadily bleeding away battle by battle, and conscious too that the omens were beginning to turn against him. Dark rumours and whispered words borne upon wings of sorcery from thousands of leagues northward spoke that other forces even now assailed the Empire, and other mighty champions clamoured for the Dark God's attention with their great and terrible deeds. Even within his own ranks, while his might remained unquestioned, as did Tamokan's devotion to the Father of Decay, some spoke of the changes recently wrought upon his stolen tyrant's body, and that they were perhaps... Uh, Mark that the play god's judgment, either for ascension or destruction, was soon to be at hand. 
Great had been Tamarkan's glory, for he had carved a trail of desolation across half the world, it seemed. He had led the horde where warlords before him had feared to tread, and the number of bodies that lay at his feet could not easily be counted. But the city of thrice-cursed Magnus, he had promised the dark gods, had yet to be delivered. At last, in a council of war, Tamarkan declared the time had come to render up a final victory to the Chaos Gods, and the horde of the Maggot Lords set forth once again westwards, where they meant to cross the world's edge mountains at Death Pass, which was both the closest route and at the time the least opposed crossing. Great armies of orcs and Skaven having fought each other to near annihilation in battle to control it in recent years. With the lands of the West so close now, and the Horde having slaughtered and slain its way so far, fresh impetus and vigour filled the Horde as it crossed the dark lands and the shadow of the Ash Ridge Mountains, and all were driven before it. Tamarkan's savage legend having become common currency amongst the misshapen ghoulkin, brutal orcs and predatory hobgoblins that lived in the western darklands. At the entrance to the wide pass they were met by a full third of the strength of the Legion of Asgur, the seared regiments of the Infernal Guard, waiting lockstep for them, with Drazhoff himself at their command, mounted upon a great burning beast like a winged bull. With them were drawn up strange iron and bronze engine caravans, half supply train and half war machine, driven forward by steam-hissing wheel carriages they called Iron Demons. They were a bizarre and frightening sight to behold. They drove on to the Death Pass all but unopposed, its denizens skulking terrified in the shadows at the baleful sight of the Great Horde and the smoke-belching armoured column that ran beside it. So it was that in the dying time of the summer in the year 2510 of the Imperial Reckoning, that like the wrath of a terrible and despoiling god, the horde of Tamarkan fell upon the unprepared lands of the Border Princes. The Border Princes have ever been a disparate and ever-shifting collection of petty kingdoms, rough-hewn territories and principalities that lie to the south of the Empire. Given no overall state or control, power in these renegade territories depends both on the sword and the strength of those that wield it and the shifting web of alliance and feud between its colonies and denizens is all but incomprehensible to outsiders. Although its hardy inhabitants are primarily human, both greenskins as well as darker forces hold sway here, while the threat of rampaging monsters from the mountains and orc raids from the Badlands to the south is constant. The exact rulership and size of any dominion within it is in a constant state of flux, this is held testament to by the fact that the land is littered with the wreckage of fallen watchtowers and overgrown settlements that have failed, often dying by violence rather than slow decay. Despite the many hardships, privations and dangers of life in the border princes, this lawless frontier of human civilization remains an irresistible draw to many in the Empire, and indeed in Tilia and Britonia, for it offers freedom from oppression, outlawry, and discrimination in their homeland. Thus are the border princes a haven for disinherited noblemen, defeated claimants to title and land, and bastard born and criminal, as well as mercenaries and outcasts of all stripes, from strange cults to peasant families fleeing a life of servitude and chattelage. Life within the border princes is hard and full of danger, and yet the coming of the Chaos Horde of Tamokan was a disaster, unlike anything these hard scrabble lands had seen for centuries. After their long travail, and the hardships they had endured in the dark lands, the Kurgan, ogres, and foul beasts within it looked upon the rolling green downs and tangled verdant forests before them, and had never before seen a land so rich and ripe for despoil, and they fell upon it like a starving jackal, set loose in a sheepfold. All but uncontrolled in their frenzy, the horde broke up almost at once into a thousand independent bands that ravaged all before them like a wildfire, drowning one petty kingdom after another in its own blood and leaving all barren and blasted in their wake. Great heaps of bodies mounded beneath grisly standards where any had the temerity to stand before them. 
Vastly outnumbered and outmatched, even the largest and most militarily capable alliance of baronies and principalities, the so-called Confederation of the Eagle, whose army of skilled and veteran mercenaries met the oncoming horde under the generalship of Lightpole the Black, an infamous sellsword general of great renown, could not slow, let alone stop the horde. The human army, comprised of arbor knights and well-disciplined pikemen, were crushed utterly, and the fleeing survivors ridden down by death-hungry Kurgan, Lightpole being almost alone in escaping the field, albeit at the expense of his own troops' horrific demise. It was only after weeks of slaughter and destruction that Tamakan's outriders, by messages both of command and unveiled threat, were able to bring back the horde, now in good spirits after the carnage they had wrought, back to heel and under his control. By the time this was done, the heart had been torn from the border princes, and it had suffered a cataclysm that would not see its population recover for nearly a generation, and unquiet and vengeful spirits haunted its downs instead. Not all of the horde did return to his command. Some small bands and vile beasts, tiring of Tamakan's yoke, fled to the border prince's hinterlands, and trouble its successors to this day. Restoring order in the host cost Tamakan and his chieftains valuable time, and meanwhile the Legion of Asgore, which had seen its own rich pickings and already begun dispatching trains of captives and plunder back to the Darklands, proved infuriatingly difficult for Tamakan to hurry, as he himself seemed to his followers less human and less sane with each passing day. Sal the Faithless cancelled speed, lest the Empire of Man know their danger and block the passes over the Black Mountains against them. And yet he seemed to frustrate his stated goal at every turn, allowing his Dolgans to wreak havoc even further afield, despite pretense to unite them once more. Matters worsened as, without warning, hurricane storms rolled in from the mountains, driving sheets of rain that turned the downs into sodden quagmires of mud, while the voices of hungry spirits in the wind howled between the peal of thunder. Day after day the storm went on unabated, unnatural and horrific in its intensity, driving Chimera and other fell creatures down from the heights to rip apart fleeing refugees and their pursuers, driven mad by the ceaseless hammering of the rains and the unearthly howling on the wind. News reached Tamakan that Blackfire Pass was awash with a flood like a great cataract, and there was no way the land machines of the Chaos Dwarves could hope to attempt its crossing, even if hauled bodily by the great beasts and giants at the Horde's despoil. Tamakan raged murderously, lashing out at his own followers and raving that he heard the laughter of the dark gods in the storm's voice. It was Lord Drazhoff who unexpectedly provided a solution. In collating such scorched books and blood-stained parchments as his forces uncovered from their path of destruction, he had learned of a pass named in some texts as the Winter's Teeth. Splintered and inhospitable it was said to have been the site of dwarf mines and citadels long since abandoned, and the pass itself was all but forgotten, but it offered an alternate route further west that might allow them to cut up into the belly of the Empire from an unexpected quarter. The unnatural storm lessened in its intensity the further west it went, and when war parties sent to scout the pass, vowed it all but untouched by the havoc that rained down, Tamakan immediately seized upon it and set the drums of the horde beating in frenzied motion. The acolytes of Nurgle, joyful in their suffering of the agus and miasmas that the foul weather brought them, and inviolate in their faith in the Maggot Lord, answered the call keenly, but others did not. Many of the ever-superstitious Kurgan saw the unnatural storm as a sign of the dark god's disfavour. Others muttered yet that the lands westward lay open and ripe for the taking, and were yet untouched by the despoiling horde. Those champions who did not embrace the plague god demanded the omen's meaning. Sal threw burning runes of prophecy across lattices of boiling elf marrow. All oh, presaging, disaster and death. When informed of these omens, Drasov merely smiled coldly and turned away while Tamakan would have none of such predictions. His fate, his glory, was but a handful of footsteps away. After all, Tamakan declared, 
The vanguard that breached the pass reported only some scattered resistance from black cow goblins that fled in panic when confronted by the Kurgan's bared blades. They had sent such weaklings to flight and slaughter many times before. Why should they fear them now? The Night Goblins Goblin kind has long spread across the face of the world as a verminous stain, despoiling and devouring and preying on anything weaker than themselves where they can. They are also highly adaptable creatures, and down the ages isolated tribes of goblins have diverged into subbreeds, some would say devolved into them, distinct from their more commonplace scavenging kin. The most widespread successful and feared of these subspecies are the night goblins, they are strange, spiteful and vicious creatures, considered insane even by the pitifully low standards of their kind. Adapted to dwelling in the lightless depths of their underground lairs, night goblins have developed a strong aversion to sunlight that leads them to habitually wear dark hoods and cloaks to keep off the rays of the sun, and all the better to crawl and skulk unseen in their subterranean realms. As such, they prefer to move around at night and usually hide away during the day, sometimes welling up from the deep places under cover of darkness to conduct brief but brutal raids on the surface, stealing away livestock and prisoners for their larders, human children being a particular favourite, as the folklore of many lands such as the Empire and Bretonia will attest. Although scrawny and gangrenous looking, things under their stained and blackened robes Night goblins, nevertheless, can be both sly and quick-footed, and while as cowardly as the rest of their kind, they find strength in numbers and can overwhelm more skilled and powerful fighters by swamping them in combat and dragging them down to be hacked and stabbed with merciless delight. They are also infamous for their use of bizarre and strange weaponry and tactics, often fuelled by the overuse of powerful fungus-brewed poisons and hallucinogens, which their shamans and the petty warlords who lead them use to instil some spite and fury in their forces. Also counted within their numbers are infamous drug-frenzied, ball-and-chain-wielding fanatics who hurl themselves at the enemy in a whirling frenzy of death. Alongside these fighters, weird, barely-controlled fungus beasts known as squigs, which are used as suicide weapons and haphazard mounts, along with mutated and gigantic spiders coaxed up from the deep caverns. It would be easy to underestimate the threat posed by the night goblins to the other peoples of the world, but the truth hidden in the dark reaches beneath its surface is that they swarm and multiply by the tens of thousands, if not in the millions, and were they somehow united, they will perhaps soon overwhelm the kingdoms above. For countless years, they have fought an unending battle for control of the under-mountains and deeps with the Skaven and the Dwarfs, as well as far worse denizens of the lightless depths. This warfare, as well as their own cutthroat treachery and rampant infighting, create a continuous attrition that has kept their numbers below epidemic proportions. But despite the never-ending death toll, they endure. The domain has slowly and cancerously spread down the centuries, Already much of what was once the great dwarf realm of holds along the world's edge mountains is now theirs, and their foul nests can be found dotted from the trackless peaks of the vaults to the frozen rocky wastelands of Norska, to the edge of the ash-strewn darklands and the borders of Far Kemri. Chapter 4 The Great Horde of Tamakan ascended the southern sides of Winter's Teeth Pass, and the chill of the high mountains quickly fell upon them, a cold mist clinging to the shadowed sides of the near-vertical network of wide ravines that awaited them after the steep central zigzag pathway that rose up from the forest below. As the footfalls of thousands quickly scattered the upper layer of detritus and forged through gnarled underbush. The truth of Lord Drasoff's lore became apparent. This indeed was no natural terrain feature, but one heavily worked and augmented in ancient days, a great thoroughfare intended for the trains of caravans and wagons. The artisanship of the dwarves that had carved it had stood the test of time, 
long after its creators had perished and their kinfolk had retreated to a few scattered refuges. The great bulk of the Kurgan and the ogres went first, clearing the way, bringing up war mammoths to shift aside boulders where they had fallen from on high. Behind them came the disciplined engine trains of the Chaos Dwarves, like great black iron serpents, hissing steam and sending ash and smoke into the frigid air, flanked by implacable columns of heavily armoured infernal guard, watching wearily their master's works and taking to the strain of the climb and the relentless pace the horde's vanguard set without discernible effort. Some distance beyond them came the rest of the horde in snarling, snapping and fractious disorder, beasts and mutants, degenerates and hulking monsters too large and too dangerous to be allowed anywhere near the rest in such tight confines, trailing back for more than a league, like a dark stain on the land. Once they had attained the high pass through the Black Mountains, the going grew easier, as the pass was far more level than might have been imagined. And high above them, the peaks and rock faces were crowned with effigies of ancient dwarf ancestor gods, heroes and runic inscriptions, weathered by time and the fury of the elements, but far from erased. Setting a brutal pace, by midday the foremost warriors soon found themselves marching through recently abandoned encampments and litter piles at the open mouths of caves, foul and unkempt. They showed clear signs of goblin kind as their makers, and many of the campfires at their fore still smoked and the stench of charred flesh hung upon the air. Further on, the Kurgan came across the remains of their own kind, those riders who had scouted ahead of the horde and not returned. They passed by the grisly, mutilated bodies of former comrades, staked or hung before the path where the pitiless greenskins had left them, to be found, while heat-cracked human and horse bones littered throughout the campfire spoke of the fate of others. At these crude barbarities, the Kurgan laughed, for they honoured the dark gods and had seen far worse in their time. Indeed, had done worse themselves. The Chaos Dwarfs were indifferent, their demeanour neither heightened nor dimmed by the findings, and as for the ogres, the scent of burning flesh merely stirred their famously insatiable appetites and made them only more impatient for battle. The sun was past its zenith, and the high pass taken in by gathering shadow, when the horde first sighted the enemy. Flitting small shapes moved along the ridges and dwarf workings above the pass, sometimes taking pot shots at the passing column with their crude bows, but never closing with the horde completely. In response, their shots were answered by desultory arrow fire in return, but whenever an enraged force broke off from the horde to chase them, the shadowy figures melted away, leaving only the echoes of their mocking laughter. <laughs> As the hours progressed towards true nightfall, the horde's casualties started to mount, but Tamakan ordered the horde onward still. He would brook no delays now he was so close to his prey, and pushed his host on, until they had reached a point where the ancient maps they followed described a wide shoulder of the mountain, its surface hammered flat, where it might be possible for the Horde to encamp with some measure of cohesion and security before the sun's setting. So it was that after a day of almost continuous harassment, the forward column of the Horde turned into the shadowed vale beneath the high peaks, and was faced by a vast sea of black cloth and leering green faces spread across the wide stony expanse. Lurid banners flapping and snapping in the chill wind. The night goblins had waited for the Chaos Force to reach a point where there was enough room for its massed tribes to deploy their numbers. Not only did the Greenskins' battle lines spread across the valley edge to edge, Perhaps as much as a league across, behind it stretched a mass of shifting darkness as far as the eye could see, shrouded by the setting sun. The immense forms of mountain giants and hulking spiders the size of mill wheels, their many-faceted eyes glittering malevolently in the dark, 
towered over the night goblins below them. As Tamakan fixed the foe with his ogre's cataract white eyes, he knew that many more night goblins were likely to be lurking in the adjoining caverns and hidden dens within the peaks, ready to spring upon the flanks and rear of his warriors once battle had been joined. Night goblins were wicked and cowardly creatures that would not have dared to bar his path, even in such numbers, unless the spite-filled war bosses that led them felt assured of some chance of victory. That they believed this was the case now, against so mighty and terrible a force as his host, spoke of either mass insanity on their part, or some dark scheme he could not yet see. The night goblins did not attack immediately, but instead stamped and clashed their weapons, screaming and howling taunts from across the barren space, clearly waiting for the horde to make the first move. Tamakan used this pause to swiftly dispatch orders to his commanders and array his vanguard into battle order, sending word along the long line behind him that battle was about to be joined and warning of imminent ambush. He summoned both Saal the Faithless and Kaizak the Befouled to his side, while Orbal flew high above the horde in an effort to gain the measure of their foe and any trickery they had planned. The Kurgan were eager to spill blood, however, and the tainted ogres more so, and soon, by order or not, the horde would make its assault and would not be held back. Bridling as it was for the carnage, after long hours of being taunted and picked at by the night goblins hidden in the heights. No sooner had Kaizak's pestilent and reeking form reached his warlord's banner, and with Saal yet far behind in the column of march, did Tamokan's own plague ogres break from the ranks and tumble headlong at the enemy, bellowing and frothing in their rage. At the sight of this, a great roar went up from the horde, and scattered bands of Kurgan marauders joined the charge, along with a maddened pack of mutant warhounds, three score strong, that fought loose of their keepers and leapt, slavering at the foe, swiftly outpacing the plague ogres with their long, loping strides. Knowing that the disordered charge would lead to disaster for the horde, Tamokan, roaring in rage, was forced to sound the general attack. The blaring cry of war mammoth tuskhorns momentarily drowning out even the din of the Kurgan's war cries. The mighty drums struck up in their wake, pounded a rapid beat, and the horde lurched forward, hoof beats and thousands of heavy footfalls echoing like a rolling peal of thunder and kicking up great clouds of dust in the cold air. With the horsemen and hounds taking the lead, Tamokan himself led the centre of the advance, surrounded by the rust and filth-spattered ranks of chaos warriors and a great fly swarm, an eternal accompaniment to the armies of Nurgle, rose before them, like an angry black cloud, casting a shadow across the valley floor. The great mass of the Night Goblin army wavered and rippled in fear at the sight of what confronted them, but they held together, bristled, jagged spear points levelled before them, partly supported by their own numbers and the prisoning rock walls to either side. With the advance halfway to the enemy, boulders and long spears, and even more bizarrely, ragged winged shapes, which proved to be screaming night goblins bound to crude winged harnesses, began to be flung wildly out at the Chaos Horde, propelled by ramshackle contraptions hidden in the mass of the night goblins' rear ranks. Many of these projectiles fell short, or careened off the rock walls, but such was the number of the onrushing horde that many found their mark, regardless of the greenskin's poor aim, and the men and horses alike were brutally impaled, crushed to bloody pulp, or cut down by spinning fragments in their headlong charge. As the ground was closed by the horde, cloud after cloud of black-fletched arrows went up from the night goblins, and the carnage in the pass was doubled, and suddenly intensified as shaman cast spells that began to crackle and spatter amongst the charging Kurgan. Curious green lights played upon the chaos marauders, and many were suddenly cast to the ground and crushed beneath the invisible weight of powerful magic. Their forces much thinned by the onslaught, the Kurgan slammed into the night goblin horde, and the entire black-clad mass seemed to shudder and quake as the line of battle quickly became a swirling melee of blood, dust and iron, stabbing spear points and hacking axe blades, rising and falling in frenzied savagery. 
Insane spinning figures lurched clear of the crush almost drunkenly, carried along by the momentum of blood-spattered weighted balls and chains. Damakan's own sledgehammer column of Nurgle-blessed warriors thundered to the fore, and behind them more and more warriors were pouring into the gap the charging vanguard had left in their wake, for there were thousands more eager to do battle in the name of the Chaos Gods and prove themselves in their Dark Master's eyes. Bubolas fell upon the night goblins with a cascade of rancid breath that momentarily stunned the greenskins and drove them back in terror, the maggot lord spurring his mount onward into them. Tamakan's blade swept out in swooping arcs, cleaving heads from bodies as Bubolus's jaws seized mouthfuls of his enemies and spat out their mangled bodies. Others the Toad Dragon simply stepped on and crushed beneath his incomparable bulk, while Tamakan gutted a mountain giant and yanked out fistfuls of its innards as bloated carrion flies swarmed into its body, devouring it from within as it wailed its piteous death cry. Without warning, the mountains themselves shuddered as strange green lightning flashed high above the battle. An instant later, a colossal grinding sound vibrated through the fabric of the world, momentarily stilling the frenzied battle and causing beast, warrior and green skin alike to stumble and fall. High above, at the entrance to the valley and at a dozen other narrow places along the pass, vast slabs of rock and ancient dwarf statuary, untouched by time, slowly shuddered into motion and began with almost galling slowness to slip from their foundations, and tumble with cataclysmic force into the pass below. Hundreds were annihilated in the blinking of an eye, and, within moments, the great serpent of the Chaos Horde had been severed into a dozen pieces, all writhing in shock at what had been wrought upon them. Vast, billowing clouds of choking dust rolled through the pass, and scores of night goblins and brutish stone trolls emerged from their concealment in the wake of the earth-shaking attack and fell upon the horde, screeching and screaming in drug-induced madness and gnawing horror. Where there had once been a single great clash, now a dozen smaller battles were joined, split over mile after mile of the snaking pass. Tamakan's horde now faced its most dire trial yet. Away from the front line, Sal the Faithless had been trapped with the advance party of the Chaos Dwarf contingent as the mountains fell within a narrow stretch of the pass, surrounded by the remnants of high-sided citadels. No sooner had the pall of dust settled and the screams of the crushed and broken died away than the attack began. A shower of black flighted arrows flew down from the heights above while from the rock walls about the pass further deep rumbles emanated. Pack beasts howled and slave bearers shuddered and fell as arrows sunk into their hides. But against the chaos dwarf infernals, who swiftly fell into square defence formations, the hail of missiles did little. A few shots inevitably found their mark, but they were few indeed, for their chaos dwarf made armour was close fitting, with barely a chink between overlapping plates. Quickly, from behind the spreading dust, screaming steam like the death cries of damned souls, an iron demon engine hove into view, dragging behind it a double carriage train, one of the fuel and the other a heavy tubular cannon, around which a trio of hellsmiths were hurriedly chanting and spraying boiling hot blood from golden thurbles onto its bell-like casing. The clanking and hissing machine quickly became the favoured target of the unseen archers in the heights, and the enemy fired their arrows as hastily as they could, but the iron demon thundered forward undaunted, shaking clear of the rubble and debris to take up the rear of a now triangular formation of Chaos Dwarf warriors, into the centre of which Sal retreated with his own bodyguard, Thing, the chattering Chaos Spore Nightmore, stumbling and rolling along behind him. No sooner had Sal gained the centre of the formation than the import of the ominous rumbling noise bore fruit. The ancient stone doors swung slowly open, and here and there in places the stony ground fell away to reveal wide passageways into the earth. 
These, like the now gaping entrances into the mountainside, were ancient dwarf works, utterly undetectable until revealed, and they were now controlled by far fouler masters than their creators. Unfolding like nightmarish, oversized parodies of men, crafted from pallid blue-grey flesh and warty scales, stone trolls surged from the blackness within the mountains. There were scores of the huge creatures, their yellow eyes rolling crazily in their lumpen heads, and their faces splitting in moon-wide grins of hunger. Behind them, the black-shrouded figures of the night goblins teemed and swarmed forth like rats, their wicked knives flashing in their hands. Gunfire crackled from the Chaos Dwarf ranks, striking down dozens as they poured forth from their tunnels. But the ambush was well planned, and the distance between the combatants too close for the assault to be halted in time. In seconds, the battle was joined, and a bloody chaotic melee ensued, the lumbering trolls and gibbering night goblins surrounding and engulfing the far outnumbered defenders. With pitiless savagery, the Chaos Dwarf Infernals cut down their foes, hacking and slashing through the night goblins, smashing them down and crushing their squealing bodies underfoot. The Infernals trusted to their own great resilience and the strength of their hell-forged armour to protect them from the frenzied press of bodies and stabbing blades. And although some fell, dagger points finding eye slits, carnage was wrought on the attacking goblins by the cruel warriors of the Black Fortress. The Stone Trolls, however, offered a far greater threat. The dull-witted but brutal creatures wielded crude mauls and double-handed axes with incredible strength that were able to pulverise even the heavily armoured Chaos Dwarves with a clean strike, while the wounds they received in return fused clothes with frightening speed, as was the gift of their monstrous kind. Where the Stone Trolls attacked in number, the Infernal's line began to buckle and fray, and even though some of the bestial trolls were cut down or hacked apart, and dismembered beyond even their abilities of regeneration, Chaos Dwarves lay shattered and slain in their wake, and the teeming night goblins still spilling in great numbers from beneath the earth rushed in to press the advantage. Surrounded suddenly and fighting for his life, Sal the Faithless, greatly wroth that his vaunted seercraft had failed him, was consumed by rage and drew upon the powers of chaos with wild abandon, channeling his sorcerous might into blinding blasts of incandescent lightning which rippled like a scythe through the night goblins and turned even the hulking stone trolls to charred skeletons, despite their legendary resistance to witchery. Above the chaos sorcerer, trailing its own web of smoky shadow, capered and snapped Nightmore, its tangled, mangled, shifting limbs, plucking screaming greenskins within range of its free, greedy moors, which snickered and flashed almost too fast to see, sending up a mist of blackish-red blood around it. The Iron Demon ground once more into motion and dragged unknown numbers of night goblins to their deaths beneath its wheels and against the many barbs and blades that adorned it. The hellish machine's cannonades fired, shredding troll and night goblin apart before it in a welter of gore, and the war machine seemed to howl and roar like a living thing at the slaughter it wrought. In answer... A weird, whistling double cry echoed around the press of the pass, and in hearing it, the night goblins answered with whoops and shrill cries of their own, as from a vast, yawning gateway in the mountainside, two freakish and enormous creatures half-crawled, half-bounded into view. Even Saul, the Faithless, was momentarily struck aghast, for he had never before seen their like. They were colossal, pumpkin-like things with rubbery, fungoid flesh of unwholesome yellow-flecked scarlet. Their bodies were swollen like rotting heads, with slavering slit mouths filled with sword-length fangs as wide as a tower gate. Even as Sal watched, he saw the first of the hulking monsters throw itself, heedless into the press of the battle, uncaring whether it crushed friend or foe beneath its bulk its impossibly wide mouth working hungrily, devouring fangs, dragging out screaming rasps of tortured metal as they pierced and severed its steel-plated prey. 
Beneath the onslaught of the colossal thing, one of the infernal regiments disintegrated in bloody mayhem. Collapsing one point of the defensive triangle, its survivors overwhelmed and dragged down as they attempted to flee the all-devouring monsters behind them. Sal retreated, coughing blood and crackling with stray discharges of power from his sorcerer's exertions. Nightmare carved a path for him as he sought refuge, putting the smoke-spitting and gore-spattered iron demon and its carriage train behind him, then the twin feasters from beneath the earth. As he did so, the hellsmith atop the weapon carriage spun the blackened bronze cannon to face its target, twisting runes and sigils glowing white hot, swimming and flowing like water across its tarnished surface. A single thunderous report sounded and a mighty bolt of molten fire flew from the muzzle and struck the foremost of the monsters, blasting it apart in a sheet of ichor and flaming gruel like a hammer striking rotten fruit. The thing's huge carcass rolled sideways and seemed to deflate as it fell, spilling a slew of its undigested victims into the dust and crushing a dozen greenskins unlucky enough to be caught in its way. The Hellsmiths on the magma cannon carriage had little time to celebrate their victory, however, as they frantically sought to reload as the second terror was upon them. The Iron Demon shuddered to turn away, but a shrill hiss of escaping pressure foretold the lurching stop that was to follow, as the carriages suddenly shunted into one another with bone-breaking force and the monster was upon them. Smashing into the gun carriage, there was a grinding clatter as the iron and bronze contraption was overturned and toppled, burning ash and cinders scattering into the air. Hellsmiths, flames licking about them, scrambled to be clear of the vast, slamming jaws, but the iron demon itself, one side of its wheels hauled clear of the ground by the huge weight that had twisted the carriages, was powerless to move or bring its own weapons to bear. The remaining infernals, still besieged on all sides by an enemy whose bloodlust had only been heightened by the carnage the monsters had caused, were too heavily pressed to mount a counter-attack and looked set to be devoured or crushed one after the other, while Sal knew that for him to conjure a spell sufficiently powerful to harm, let alone have a chance to slay the monster, would likely kill him too in his exhausted state. Sal the Faithless cursed Tamokan loudly for his folly and pride, and prepared to gather the wild vortexes of magic that rippled across the battlefield unseen to mortal eyes, to him, and make an end to this enemy, even though it might consume him. Knowing such an action would mark a fitting pyre of destruction for one such as he. Lightning and storm winds played about the Chaos Sorcerer, as at last, with a tortured shriek of metal, the steam carriage's coupling snapped, flinging metal explosively in all directions, and the monstrous thing rolled forward, its vast jaws opening wide. Sal laughed in triumphant madness. But before he could loose his spell, the ground beneath the colossal beast erupted upward in a great sheet of blackness and flame. The blast threw the Chaos Sorcerer off his feet, and he fought with every ounce of his twisted body and tainted soul to maintain his grip on the powers he had summoned, but to no avail. The power ripped out of him like a thrashing whipcord, smashing and withering all it touched, and Sal screamed voicelessly as he too burned. Out at the front of the horde, the great battle in the enclosed valley was beginning to turn, for even though the night goblins numbered in the tens of thousands, and had cut off the head of Tamakan's horde from any help. They soon found that they had woefully underestimated the strength and savagery of the warriors of the northern wastes. Iron-shod hooves, shattered skulls, and spear shafts, and razor-edged blades of newly forged black steel from the furnaces of Tsar cleft shields asunder, and hacked apart the night goblins cowering behind them as if they were no more than rag dolls. Footstep by bloody footstep, the night goblin throng was pushed back, the ground thick with bodies as great wedges were thrust deep into the greenskin's ranks, where the chaos warriors, tall and inviolable, and sheathed in otherworldly armour, contemptuously tore through the greenskin's embattled defence, 
like reapers scything down wheat. Panic and disorder started to ripple through the sable-shrouded mass, and those caught before the fury of Tamokan's horde tried to flee but were prevented by the press of bodies behind them, only to be savaged by the ripping fangs of chaos hounds as they attempted to flee. The night goblin archers, and soon their slipshod war machines, began to fire into the very thick of the battle line in desperate fear of their own lives as the chaos forces pressed ever closer, killing as they came, and more often than not the green skin shot and stone fell short, landing directly in the tightly packed green skin ranks, and great showers of foul night goblin blood burst over the battlefield like rain. Soon the panic became a rout, and those at the front of battle abandoned their weapons as they clawed and scrambled over those behind in their efforts to escape. Even now, as the tide of battle turned, the Greenskins were not entirely without guile or power, for hidden amongst their ranks were many vile and dangerous creatures, as well as shaman, whose spells now began to fizz and spatter amongst the Kurgan line. Eerie light played upon the Chaos troops, and several dense knots of armoured warriors were suddenly cast to the ground and crushed to gore-stained pulp beneath the invisible weight of powerful magic. The Horde's own sorcerers, concealed in the ranks, frantically wove their counterspells, but the magic of the Greenskins was strange and elusive, and blasts of verdant green energy fell upon the leading Chaos warrior bands like hammer bows. At the head of one great thrust of Nurgle's blessed warriors, which punched into the Night Goblin throng, was Tamokan. As he hacked and crushed his way forwards, Bubolus was struck again and again by sorcerous bolts that caused the beast to roar in pain. The onslaught of the Night Goblin magic left a strange bitter tang in the air that unsettled the great beast, and even the fly swarm that clustered about them drew high into the air to escape it. Tamakan's warband had almost reached to the very heart of the Night Goblin army, where, beneath a blanket of woven darkness, an ancient and wizened Night Goblin shaman perched malevolently, enthroned back a giant albino spider, dredged up from the dark bowels of the earth, and armoured with the bones of a thousand victims, lashed to its carapace with flayed skin fetishes. Around the great corpse pale spider flew the banners of the tribes who opposed Tamakan and claimed the winter's teeth pass for their own. The murder grins and the corpse gutters, the empty skulls and the dead moons. On catching sight of his enemy, Tamakan lowered his great axe and bellowed a challenge, spurring on the decaying and nightmarish warriors that surrounded him onto greater heights of fury and destruction. Coiling fogs of glowing green vapour filled the air and drove the night goblins into a whirling frenzy, and they hurled themselves heedless into their enemies, only to be speared or beaten down beneath the crushing charge of Kazakh's rot knights, or smashed apart by the skull-headed flails of Nurgle's chosen. Sorcerer acolytes were swift to answer the night goblin's fog with infinitely more lethal magics of their own, and soon bilious yellow black fumes descended upon the enemy, spreading baleful contagion and ugly death wherever they went. In the face of this horrific onslaught, the night goblin's counterattack first began to falter and then failed. Sensing that the end had come, the night goblin army fled in abject terror and the chaos horde pursued. At the head of the fighting Tamakan's axe rose and fell, carving a bloody arc through all before him as the green skin scattered like mice before the harvest sickle. Bubolus roared with all his might, and his rancid breath was a poisoned wind that choked the life out of the panicked night goblins. All was mayhem and confusion. In their eagerness, none held back, but gave full vent to their fury. So that the greenskins were pressed together into the valley's narrow exits where their bodies were soon piled ten deep, and their fellows clambered over them to be free from the wrath of chaos unleashed. Still, Tamakan did not stop, but drove on as the valley narrowed, pursuing the night goblins through a defile with his decaying disciples and blood-drenched bile trolls close behind. The great beasts shoved aside the mound of corpses to reach their foes, 
but frustratingly, the great albino spider, now short a chitinous leg where one of Tamakan's plague spawn had ripped it free, and bleeding pink ichor from a dozen wounds, made its escape up the sheer rock face, the ancient shaman clinging desperately to its back, and disappeared behind a weathered statue and into the darkness. With their leader taken flight, the rout of the night goblins became an insane stampede to escape, and the victorious slaughter belonged to the horde. Elsewhere, along the many winding miles of Winter's Teeth Pass, battles both great and small were fought, and in many the forces of chaos were triumphant, but in some places the night goblin ambush had proved more successful, and victory for the horde had only been brought at great cost. In others, Tamakan's followers had been wiped out completely, their bodies carried away into the darkness, so only blood-caked dust and shattered weapons remained to mark their passing to their surviving comrades. In the aftermath, it had been clear that not only had the Night Goblin tribes been involved in the attack, so had many orcs, tall, muscle-bound greenskins armed with heavy cleavers and massive iron shields that had thrown themselves too upon the horde's rearguard, only to be slaughtered in droves by the myriad fangs and claws of the chaos beasts and mutated monsters they found there. The horde encamped that night where it had fought, surrounded by the burning pyres of the dead to light the darkness, sore and weary. No second attack came. The enemy had been spent, not only in numbers, but in the will to resist. With the pale light of dawn came a war council, fractious and bitter with recriminations. But on it, Tamokan imposed his will once more, although now more through outright threat and fear than any sense of the Chaos God's promised glory or duty to him and the others. Only Kaizak, his ever-rotting flesh seeping through many fresh rents in his armour, stood foursquare with his leader without qualm or dissent. The greatest cause for trouble was not the ambush or the bloodshed of the previous day, but the need of labour. In order to overcome the shattered rocks that had fallen to block the pass in a dozen places, Great ramps needed to be built to allow for the passage of horses and beasts, and most particularly for the war machines of the Chaos Dwarfs to move over them. Accordingly, the Kurgan chiefs, whose fighters still made up the bulk of the Horde's manpower, along with Tamakan's own sworn plague ogres, would be the muscle and bone needed to accomplish this. This rankled the proud warriors of the North, who saw such labour as the work of slaves, and flatly refused to be under the direction of the Chaos Dwarfs while doing so. Eventually, through threat of bloody reprisal and dire necessity, was accommodation reached between them. And although none were happy with the arrangement, the crude ramps were built with piled debris for stones and pulped green-skinned flesh for mortar, and the horde once more struggled into life and movement. Resentment simmered now within the ranks, where all should have been eager for battle, their final goal at last in sight. But Tamakan cared not for this, for the throne of chaos was nearly in his grasp. A realm at war. Times of peace are rare in the Empire, and the hour of Tamakan's coming was not one of them. With Brushfire wars taking place in the north, heavy orc raids in the west, and the blighted lands surrounding horror-haunted Sylvania once more stirring into unhallowed life. These conflicts, as well as bloody dynastic squabbles in the province of Talibutland, had already seen state troops dispatched from both Noln and Wiesenland to aid the Empire's defence, thinning the forces that would be available to meet this unforeseen threat. Indeed, the armies of the Empire had seen several rough seasons of campaigning over the past few years, and were stretched thin in many places. Aid for Wiesenland from the Empire's other provinces would likely be slow in coming. It was not entirely true, however, to claim that the Empire was, at the time of the Maggot Lord's approach, as weak as it might seem. The Realm of Sigmar had endured for more than two and a half thousand years, despite endless plagues, disasters and wars, thanks in no small part to the hardiness of its people 
and the often ruthless acumen of its leaders. But most of all, because, while it may be riven with rivalry, intrigues and discord, when attacked from without, it grows stronger, and unity before a common enemy is the normal state of affairs, rather than its exception. Furthermore, Nolan, even though a sizable proportion of its standing armies were elsewhere when the dark news of the Horde's approach reached the great city, still had a standing body of several thousand armed men it could call upon to defend it, along with strong contingents from several knightly orders who maintained chapter houses in the city. As one of the greatest seats of industry in the Empire, its warehouses and forges were also well provisioned with arms and armour, cannon and black powder, with which it could both raise a great militia from the teeming masses which flocked to the city and supply its professional soldiery without fear of shortage in a protracted battle. The Countess Emanuela of Nong, while no frontline general herself, was nevertheless shrewd of mind and iron of will, as attested to by her long and relatively stable reign over the city-state, and had survived many threats and challenges to her life and power in the past. She had also been known to quote an old proverb of Tilian origin when her lack of personal martial prowess had been called into question. Wars, the proverb went, are waged by warriors, but won with gold. And gold, Noln, and the Countess in particular possessed in abundance. And as the dire import of Tamokan's threat became apparent, she was wise enough to realise that an empty coffer was infinitely preferable to a slaughtered city. To this end, with preferred payment, open bribery, along with called on ties of duty and not a few veiled threats, the Countess's court was quick to impress upon a number of powerful and largely independent factions within the great city-state of Nong the need to prepare for war, and to do so sooner rather than later. Some, like the warlike Church of Sigmar, needed no convincing to raise its might against the ancient arch-enemy, and soon preachers and warrior priests could be found on any street corner screaming and exhorting the masses to holy war, while crazed flagellant bands scoured themselves bloody at their feet and ruthlessly hunted down and put to death any they suspected of chaos taint. Others, such as the venerable and lauded Imperial Gunnery School, required a little more finesse and purse-filling, before they would release the full might of their artillery trains and their own Ironside regiments to Nong's defence, above and beyond what duty and standing contract required. Alongside these, scores of smaller bargains were struck between Nong and dozens of mercenary companies, both great and small, as well as notoriously acerbic and independent battle wizards and engineers who made the city their home, and even the half-dozen experimental land ships ordered by the city-state of Marienburg and being built in the city were impressed into service at exorbitant cost. All this the Countess had determined would be needed for Nolan's defence, though even now as news trickled in of massacres and destruction to the south, naysayers among the nobility and mercantile houses claim that the Horde, like a dozen greenskin incursions and beastmen ravages before it, would spend its strength long before it reached the city, and that even if it did, the city was impregnable. These ne'er-do-wells muttered at the expense, poured scorn on the threat, and seditiously whispered of the Countess's ill judgment and weakening mental state. It was not until Theodore Bruckner, the Countess's hulking champion and headsman, mounted a dozen heads belonging to vaunted and important men upon spikes above the gate of the trade quarter, that such talk was, if not silenced, then reduced to private whisper. Chapter 5 It was nearly a full moon's turning after the great bulk of Tamokan's horde was able to descend from the Black Mountains and into the lands of Sigmar's empire. Over the previous days the horde had unleashed parties of scouts and raiders to assay what lay ahead of them, and those that returned had made report of what they had discovered. Some had explored the rolling, half-wild hill country of Wiesenland and found only embers and ruin, deserted roads and abandoned farms. There could be little doubt that the horde was expected. Others had encountered enemy patrols and came back bearing the trophies of victory 
or not at all. A few had succeeded in taking prisoners, though few of these survived to reach the camp of the Chaos Horde. Some captives died of their wounds before they could be interrogated, while others succumbed to the attentions and appetites of the captors en route. Tamakan had grown increasingly impatient and brooding since the battle against the Night Goblins. The many wounds he had suffered had since become increasingly infected and suppurating in a manner which pleased the followers of Chaos that attended him, but to those not of his faith made him even less human, both in aspect and mind, and even more difficult to deal with. It was left then to Sal the Faithless, still half crippled himself, but slowly recovering his strength to listen carefully to the reports of all the raider bands as they returned and pieced together what lay before them. Whilst captives lived, he oversaw the work of their tortures, and when they died, Sal watched as the shaman bound their spirits and continued to question them long into the night. He inspected the weapons of war that the raiders brought back as trophies and bid their hellsmiths of the Black Fortress examine the arms and armour of the enemy with all their considerable expertise, of which they took a special interest in the few firearms taken by the Chaos Marauders. By this means, Sal learned all he could of the enemy's capabilities and of the lands of the Empire before them. Once the Horde had assembled its forces in the cold downs at the foot of the Black Mountains, at Tamakan's bidding was a council of war called. Here, Sal spread a great map of fresh-sown skin upon the ground before them, and anchored the corners of the parchment with chunks of slowly pulsing warpstone, so that all could see what was inscribed upon it, and the figures and signs thereon danced as if alive. With gluttonous greed, Tamukan looked on as the sorcerer spoke of the wide green lands the reavers had encountered, and the signs that terror of the horde had gone before it and so emptied the countryside and forests, save for a few stubborn holdfasts, high-walled towns and watchtowers to contest them. At the furthest reach of the dragon's wingbeat, far to the northwest had their quarry been sighted, a great city rising from the land where two mighty rivers met, as great as any the northmen had ever seen, tower after tower as white and pale as sea cliffs, and between them roof after roof of glittering slate, piled one atop another in great profusion. Below them stood a vast tangle of streets, as maddening as any labyrinth of the underworld, and walls bristling with cannon, whose thunderous shot had driven off the interlopers of the air. Nolm went up the cry from Tamokan in bloodlust and ardour and the warlords and shaman, bray beasts and fell sorcerers echoed it in turn, drowning out Sal's words of caution, so that he fell silent as others were swift to draw in and make their feverish plans of conquest. Of all the war leaders present, only Drazoth, the Ashen, kept his own counsel and viewed the gathering with an unreadable cold contempt. The city of madness will fall! I will crush first Nuln, and then, with Father Nurgle's blessing, I shall ravage his land and sweep away the empire of man, exclaimed Tamakan triumphantly. More mundane matters of division and attack were then settled quickly upon, and first of those was the matter of provender and spoil and with this in mind the horde was split into three columns that would spread out before coming together again to ravage the city that harboured their goal. The greater part of the horde with Tamokan would take the most direct route over the rolling hill country northward, and Sal's Dolgans would take a more westerly route along the river, smashing a series of petty towns and keeps that had been espied along the way. The only narrow but serviceable roadway a remnant of the days centuries before when this land was far more populated and trade-strong, would be given to the Legion of Asga, its more passable terrain being most suited for use by the Chaos Dwarf machine train. All would depend on speed, for it was clear that surprise was lost to them. Some survivors of the destruction they had wrought in the Border Princes had somehow survived to tell the tale of the Horde. But if fortune favoured them, the Empire would still be slow to rally its false strength 
to counter a massive attack from this unexpected quarter, as Tamokan had bargained all along. The great horde of Tamokan departed its camps north of Winter's Teeth Pass, moving rapidly and with hunger for the destruction they ached to wreak. It spread across the region quickly, splitting apart into its divisions and rolling forward with frightening speed. Much of the land before it had been emptied of people and livestock, but here and there holdouts remained, walled towns and way fortresses, either too stubborn to flee or placing their faith in sturdy stone fortifications that had seen off orcs and other marauders before, or ill-fortuned garrisons that had been ordered to fight to the last man to delay the onrushing enemy. Neither, however, had any true inkling of what was to befall them, or the true horror and power of the death that was about to reach out and take them. None could guess that Tamakan's horde now numbered perhaps a third of what it had been, even reinvigorated by ogres and chaos dwarf allies from the size it had set out at. But, in truth, it did not matter. For against the tens of thousands that remained, screaming Dolgan horsemen, nightmarish chaos creatures, and the fires of her Schutz chosen, there was no defence. Hornfen was the first to feel the wrath of chaos, the town well used to raids being situated in the barrens of the former realm of Soland, was protected by a wide moat before its banked walls and the town's bridge had been destroyed by its inhabitants, but the terrified townsfolk could do little but look on in horror as the Dolgan war mammoth simply waded through the water under their guns and sundered the gates. Not one of the men and women of Hornfen lived to see the dawn after the ritual orgy of violence to honour the dark gods that was to follow. The story was repeated time and again, as the horde's three-pronged assault ate up the ground and fell upon any unfortunate or foolhardy enough to be caught in their path. Ruckberg was taken in the night, emptied of civilians who had fled up river in boats. Its garrison of state troops and peasant militia stood little chance against the screaming horsemen and the devilish magics of the chaos sorcerers ranged against them. Castle Greymane, whose infamous claw-shaped keep had been in legend the birthplace of arch lector and damned necromancer alike over its long history, was laid waste, the power of the Chaos Dwarves' demon-forged artillery smashing it apart with sustained bombardment. The lords of the Black Fortress eager to test their firepower against a worthy target. The driving pace was not without its cost, however, and as the siege engines and wagon trains lumbered along and the vanguard pressed ahead, soon the column became so strung out that an attack would have surely destroyed many of the machines and wreaked great slaughter among the army. But of the enemy, there was no sign. The rapid pace of the advance took its toll upon machines and beasts and a wake of wreckage and corpses, lay strewn behind the route of march. Here and there, lone parties of chaos dwarfs grappled with broken-down engines, bent drive shafts and shattered wheels, while the Kurgan abandoned the weak and the dead at will, and the beasts of chaos devoured any that fell to assuage their hunger. Outriders roamed far to the north and reported the land northward, now deserted save for a flurry of activity around the great city. And such was Tamokan's rage on finding the town of Gunatag utterly deserted and left aflame, when only days before Orbel Vipergut had reported a stalwart defence prepared. The Maggot Lord ordered the flames extinguished, and the land foully defaced and desecrated in honour of Nurgle. It was here that the Horde once again came together for the final assault. Twenty-one days after breaking their camp at the foot of the Black Mountains, the Chaos Horde beheld the white-towered city. The Kurgan regarded its high walls and stern defences, and knew that whole armies might break upon such fortifications, so high that not even a giant might scale them unaided. Their blood and fury spent without ever stepping one foot inside their enclosure, cut down by shot and shell. Tamokan brought the Lord of the Black Fortress before him and bid him speak to the matter. After all, why else had the dwarfs of Tsar dragged their machines and great siege engines halfway across the world, if not to topple fortifications such as these? 
Drasov laughed. Walls, he scorned. I see only piles of sand crafted by children. Bring my brothers close enough and we shall take pleasure in fulfilling our bargain and toppling them for you. The Chaos Horde arrayed themselves for battle five leagues due south of the great city and marched towards their goal. Tamakan rode up and down the lines of troops aback his toad dragon, bellowing and exhorting them to fight with utmost savagery for the dark gods were watching. Wherever he went, he was greeted by war cries, the unearthly howls of beasts, vile oaths and the hammering of blade on shield, for now at last the Kurgan would see battle, not battle against the cursed greenskins such as they had fought at Winter's Teeth Pass, but battle against the men of the Empire. Around them, with a pall of dim and acrid fog, a sorcerous concoction designed to hide their true numbers and strength. The Emperor's army had taken up position before the city walls, on a low, palisaded rise, with cannon arrayed across its front, as well as on the walls above, so to maximise its firepower. The mass of the opposing army standing behind the cannon line, with ranks of spearmen and gunners set to receive the horde's charge, while providing room for swift withdrawal should the Chaos Horde press too close. Tamakan knew well the stories of the battles and warlords that had gone before him, and he knew that the cannon of the Empire were to be feared as much as those of the dwarfs of Tsar. The weaponry of the Empire soldiers shone brightly in contrast to the black and scored armour of the Kurgan, and the tainted and sickly greenish metal that adorned his own followers. Tamakan grinned lopsidedly with the great degenerate wound his mouth had become, for his enemy had already made a fatal error. They had arrayed for battle, expecting a headlong charge, which they might cut down with their guns, but he had brought guns of his own. The horde brought up to a halt just beyond the range of the enemy's cannon, a handful of which cracked and spattered up mud and soil before them impotently. Once all was ready, Tamakan raised his colossal axe high and let it fall. The signal was given. From beneath the fog, with a deafening roar, the brazen and black iron vessels of destruction began the battle. Eerily glowing projectiles arcing up through the dense mist soon began to fall with frightening accuracy down on the closely packed Empire batteries behind the outer palisade. The explosion of the Chaos Dwarfs' dread quake mortar shells, filled as they were with powerful alchemical explosives, was devastating. Great plumes of flame lanced upwards, shredding men and cannon with equal ease, while the ground itself shook where they fell like a wounded animal. As the wave of destruction rippled through the enemy and confusion and horror broke out in the ranks, a great bloodthirsty cry went up from the horde, and in an instant the great mass leapt forward as one. Dolgan horsemen and Kurgan knights surged forwards, twisted hounds braying at their heels, and behind them came the roiling spawn and thunder-footed ogres and trolls, an unholy mass of hate and muscle bent only on slaughter. What followed was a shockingly quick descent into madness and death. Cannon roared on both sides, and men and beasts were torn apart. Rather than stand and die before the onslaught, a wedged column of armoured knights broke forward in countercharge, while behind them regiments held their ground stonily, while panicked militia cowered in terror or tried to flee back through the city gates. The skies above blackened with swarms of flies and resounded to the doom-laden wing-beats of dragons and chimera, which descended to smoke cannon from atop the high walls and rampage through the city streets. Horsemen from both sides clashed over the open ground between the two armies. Black-armoured Kurgan Chaos Knights fought against glittering Reichsguard, each charging through the ranks of the other and turning to charge again. Around them swirled a loose mass of lightly armed cavalry, the marauders of the wastes on one side and Empire pistoliers on the other. The crack of the Empire horsemen's pistols carried above the shouts and trumpet blasts. Behind the advancing horde came the gun carriages of the Chaos Dwarves, hauled slowly forward by the smoke-belching iron demon engines. They unleashed a steady creeping barrage on the foe, 
keeping their fire ahead of the battle line until the walls and towers shook with their wrath and burst aflame one after another. The cavalry battle proved brutal and short, with the Empire forces, wildly outnumbered, soon overwhelmed and scattered, and with a mighty roar, the whole Chaos Horde surged forward and crashed like a tidal wave into the outer palisade of the Empire forces, who tried to sound a general retreat behind the walls. Shells and fireballs fell before the gate, forcing those who would flee to run a gauntlet of death, while those who survived on the battlements above rained down handgun shot and crossbow bolts with frantic desperation, in the hope of slowing the unstoppable tide. There was an almighty blast as a dozen hellish war engines spoke as one, and the great portcullis gate of the city, even then beginning to draw closed, exploded in a river of fire and disintegrated slowly into the rubble. Its ponderous collapse, dragging wall towers to ruin around it, and crushing hundreds in its death throes. The horde's warriors, all but knocked flat by the thunderclap and rush of hot air, howled in triumph, while the soldiers of the Empire screamed hopelessly, their spirits broken. Hook-handed giants scrambled over the debris, dragging huge lengths of chain behind them, tearing cannon and mortars down from the walls, from within and serving in death as scaling ladders for the hundreds of screaming fighters following behind. Plague ogres smashed and slashed their way through desperate pockets of defenders and fell ravenously on the bodies. The dust-filled sky darkened to a natural twilight, riven with screaming incendiary rockets, casting a lurid glow over the carnage, as the horde of the Maggot Lord poured into the city, insane with the joy of battle. The city burned. In the court of the Countess Emanuela von Leipwitz of Nuln, the coming of the horde had driven out all other cares and concerns. The great city of Nuln lay at the heart of the Empire of Man, and was a realm of industry and intrigue, and the only true rival to Oldorf, the imperial capital in both size and power. Protected somewhat by its geographical position, it had long wielded its position of wealth and influence to arm and rebuild the war-torn empire, growing rich upon the recurring trials of civil dissent, invasion and catastrophe that have plagued the realm's long history with the frequency of seasonal storms. But now it unexpectedly faced the dire threat of an enemy at its own gates, an enemy with a strength unseen in generations by the city. It was not only the sheer size and power of the Horde that was the cause of grave concern for the safety of the city and wider empire, but also its speed and deliberation that magnified its threat. Rumours of Tamil Khan's coming had first surfaced several months earlier when stories of dark armies ravaging the southern border princes had been abruptly cut off with sinister swiftness. The flood of refugees fleeing ahead of the danger had been suddenly stilled, which offered a dire suggestion of what had happened on the other side of the Black Mountains. But it was not till the arrival of the infamous mercenary warlord, light-poled the Black, bloodied and battered, in the frontier fortress of Mendelhof, which guarded the approaches of Blackfire Pass, that an impending threat to the Empire was first truly realised. Although sought under pain of death by several of the Empire's noble houses, and considered an unscrupulous butcher and dishonourable turncoat by most, Leipold's reputation as a general was, however, unquestioned, and when he spoke of his own shattered principality and the ravages of the Chaos Horde from the east, the Castellan of Mendelhof listened. The Margrave of Wizenland, Olga Hock, upon learning of the impending threat, had immediately dispatched strong reinforcements to the defence of Blackfire Pass, while Lightpole himself was escorted under armed guard back to Nuln to give evidence before the Countess's court. While the Margrave raised his banners and stirred his far-flung principality for war in the great city-state of Nuln, in whose thrall Wiesenlands largely stood, the impending invasion was treated with growing concern. Augries were taken, and the portents of the city's churches of Sigmar and my media, as well as the prognostications of the resident wizards of Nuln's celestial orrery, 
or prophesied onrushing doom. But uh, for the Countess Emanuela, who ruled her fractious city-state from behind her impassive mask of porcelain, it was the reappearance at the court of the amethyst magistrix, Elizabeth von Draken, known in whispers to some as the graveyard rose in the myths and legends of the city, that was the surest indication that a cataclysm was at hand. Elspeth von Draken was feared and renowned in equal measure by those who ruled none. The powerful wizardess he usually stood apart from the politics of imperial power and the empire's colleges of magic, engaging with the city only when some dire peril or deadly rival plagued it, and that von Draken's eerie voice was now added to the chorus of predicted bloodshed was proof enough for the Countess that Leipold's story held validity. The Magistrex, in closed session of the Countess's War Council, spoke of the restless, invisible winds of magic, and of how they waxed strong and savage. She spoke of how the souls of the dead had spoken to her of the coming storm, and how for long moons she had felt Shayesh, the deathly force that empowered her own arcane art, drawn like iron filings to a lodestone, flowing ever southwards, hungrily to the horde, and the stain of slaughter it wrought upon the world. With the dread catmine dragon that was her steed, enslaved to her will by the amethyst magic that flowed like blood through her veins, she followed the invisible currents of death into the ravaged border princes, and hovered like a carrion crow above the fields of the slain, and stole secrets from the dying souls she found there. Elspeth von Draken knew the face of the enemy, and the horror they would visit upon Sigmar's empire. Nan's preparations for war were already gathering pace when reports came to the city of a vast chaos horde, not in Blackfire Pass, as expected, but having already crossed over Winter's Teeth Pass, was massing in the barons of the Southern Empire. Confusion reigned, and Olga Hock immediately ordered the evacuation of his forces from the sparsely inhabited lands nearby. This country, formerly counted as part of Soland, a province of the Empire long ago destroyed and annexed to Wiesenland, was largely left to fend for itself when the Margrave massed his forces to defend his heartlands and suffered before the chaos onslaught. Wiesenland was ever a sparse, bleak place, its people dour and well used to the privations of raiders and beasts, as well as killing winter cold and the murderous wrath of nature. The abandonment of so much widely flung land to fend for itself was a tactic that had been employed before, to fall back and leave nothing to the invader, to weaken and starve the attacker before meeting them in battle at a time and place of the Empire's choosing, was a tried and tested tactic to the Wiesenlanders, but against Tamokan's horde, it would prove a doomed enterprise. This was no erratic and ill-disciplined orc raid, nor even a half-unseen war of ambush and brutal surprise attack, as might be expected from a marauding bray herd of beastmen. Instead, the sheer size, speed and ferocity of the Chaos Horde caught the Wiesenlanders off guard, and made a mockery of any attempts to delay or impede its progress. Fortified holdfasts, fortresses and watchtowers were smashed to rubble with contemptuous ease, their attackers barely pausing to loot the remains, and it was not until the three-pronged tide of destruction closed with frightening swiftness on Thaldorf, the province's capital, that the sheer scale of the threat was realised with horror. Reinforcements, recalled from Blackfire Pass, had not yet arrived, and Olga Hock, the old Margrave, saw his doom in the dust and smoke that the Great Horde and its tens of thousands kicked up on the horizon, but refused to abandon his city to the enemy, despite calls to do so from the Countess's emissaries. But he did order its evacuation, but for the soldiery, and the last eddies of frantic refugees had barely departed when a thunderous sound of hooves and drumbeats were heard in the distance. Hawk, the veteran of a score of battles, had drawn up his forces before the city walls, supported by troops and cannon lining the battlements. Then, forcing his enemy into an attack on a narrow front and into the teeth of his firepower, he had hoped to break their charge and prevail. But he had not counted on the dark war machines of the Chaos Dwarves, 
nor the savage strength of the monstrous army before him. He paid for his mistake with his life, and the lives of four thousand and more of his men, as the emptied city met its doom. News of Faldorf's destruction came like a thunderbolt to the people of Nuln, and threatened panic in the tide of refugees entering the city. And it was met with a swift and brutal crackdown of law, with the imposition of fines and impressed service in the militia as favoured punishment for troublemakers, or anyone who happened to be standing near them at the time while order was imposed. For the forces of Nuln, who arrayed for battle, knowing the enemy was no more than a handful of days away at best, the destruction of Fardorf and its defenders represented a blow, but also brought them time and precious intelligence about their foe, not least news of their sorcerous might and the strange and terrible siege engines they possessed, and the Countess Emanuela and her council of war drew their plans accordingly. Tamakan's rage had been such that he ordered the city of Fardorf laid waste, and the Legion of Asgore had been happy to comply showering the gambrel-roofed tower houses and warrens of narrow streets within centuries until the ruins blazed in a great conflagration. The pall of smoke from the burning city was clearly visible many leagues away in the wavering light of the following dawn, so that even from the high battlements of Nuln's outer curtain walls, Faldorf's dark fate was unquestionable. Within the horde's ranks, the festering sore of discontent had wept out violence and distrust as the truth that their target had not been the desired one became known. Those who favoured differing masters succumbed to infighting, scorn and recrimination, although many in truth did not care whose blood they spilled or what walls they tumbled so long as they had the chance to deal death and destruction in the sight of the gods. It was rather the fact that Tamokan had been in error. They had been made to look like fate's fool that was the cause of the acrimony and foreboding for the warriors of the Northlands and the servants of chaos both despise weakness and some saw in it the cruel humour of the gods themselves directed at Tamokan. Hundreds died as the malcontent of the horde bore fruit over the following days and fissures opened up within its unity, such as it was, until it began to split along divisions of race and dark faith. While Tamakan himself retreated within the private circle of Nurgle's followers, burying himself for days in foul rituals of appeasement and propitiation to his master, the Lord of Decay. The Chaos Dwarfs and Drasoth showed great displeasure that they had expended valuable munitions and machinery against the wrong target and demanded recompense. And while Tamakan was sequestered in foul ritual, perhaps surprisingly, it was Sal the Faithless who stepped into the breach of leadership and offered them the right to a victim of their own, the fortified town of Dacker House, to the northwest to keep them occupied, to besiege and despoil, unimpeded as they saw fit. This they did with swiftness and brutal efficiency, taking the town by storm in a savage night attack. Sundering the gates with modified iron demon engines they called skullcrackers, fitted with steam-driven arsenals of massive, pulverising mauls and whirling scythe blades, which made appallingly short work of stone, wood and flesh in their path. Supported by magma cannon fire and a searing cloud of ash conjured by Lord Drasoth and his cabal of demon smiths to bedevil the defenders at the battlements. Dagger House was taken largely intact, the disciplined warriors of the Infernal Guard making short work of the defenders once they were within the walls, gunning down any that resisted and profaning the temples of the human gods with the blood of their priests and rededicating them to the supremacy of Ashut, their own dark deity, constructing sacrificial pyres where once their altars had stood. Well, unfortunately for the townsfolk of Dacker House and the refugees that had flocked there, they were offered no quick death, for the scions of Tsar Nagrond had come not to slaughter, but enslave, and soon the whole town became a fortified slave stockade, as the Legion of Asgore took it over for their base of operations, quickly shoring up the defences they had destroyed and cutting off the river crossing. Meanwhile, as the days 
ticked by like the passage of a clock's hand. The rest of the horde began to slowly fracture into disparate warbands, pillaging almost aimlessly across the lands to the south of Nong, while the forces of the Empire were content to rally in the great city and wait for the inevitable attack each day, bolstering their power slowly but surely. As just as fractionally the horde's cohesion and power wasted away, it took an attempt on Tamokan's life to rouse the Chaos Lord from his filth-tainted reverie. Unseen, silent, and shrouded by subtle magics, the lone assassin had stalked through the cinders and scorched ruins of Fardorf to the noisome encampment the Maggot Lord's closest acolytes had made in the broken and burned remnants of Sigmar's temple that now jutted from the ruins like a cracked ribcage. Here a thousand rotting bodies had been heaped up around a great pit dug into the crypts below, their necrotic juices seeping into the carrion earth to form a sluice of surpassing foulness in which the demon things crawled and Tamakan himself bathed in the befouled darkness. Knowing that it could not long remain unnoticed, despite the spell weavings around it, upon stalking over to the mouth of the corpse pit, the assassin threw off its coverings and leapt burning into the abyss below lightning pouring from its eyes and mouth its outline flickering and blurring out of step from the world around it like a phantasm it struck the black waters with a thunderous discharge of power and a hiss of boiling ozone the foul gases that filled the crypt igniting in unearthly waves of green and amber flame at the touch of the assassin's shivering skin Blackened sword blades dancing with witch fire licked out with impossible speed as the assassin flickered through the black water, slicing and burning the bloated flesh of hulking demon plague toads that rose up against it. A bile troll came howling from the darkness, its long boneless arms reaching out to claim the assassin, but it was too slow, and a burning blade plunged into each of its eye sockets as the assassin spun on past it, knowing it had to reach its quarry before it was too late and it was overwhelmed by the nightmarish forces which filled the crypt. The assassin sped along a line of stone bears, half submerged in the reeking waters ever closer to the heart of darkness, when its quarry came instead to it, as Tamokan, more bloated and terrible than ever in aspect, came roaring from the darkness, trailing a miasma of sickening fog in his wake. A fist, like a battering ram, came flying towards the assassin, and it barely dodged aside in time as the stone statue of some forgotten priest shattered under the blow instead. The blackened blades danced out, lightning arced and rotted flesh burned. Tamakan laughed. A hideous gurgling sound in his ruined throat as the blade sank into his swollen flesh, which pulsed obscenely around them and seared shut, trapping the swords, and a backhanded blow from the maggot lord sent the assassin tumbling away into the black waters. The assassin resurfaced moments later, power burning bright within it, showing the outlines of its skull and bones through flesh grown translucent with the blue-white flame from within, gathering all of its power for a desperate final attack. The Maggot Lord did not give it the chance, smashing the stone lid of a sarcophagus across the assassin like an oversized club, shattering stone and the body it struck, with a thunderclap erupting through the crypt. Like a broken doll, the assassin once more struggled to rise from the black waters, but he was not alone in the foul wash, and long bony fingers grasped at it. Baleful eyes glimmered in the filth, and leering grins met its final struggles with savage mirth. After Nurgle's tallyman and their pets had had their way with the assassin, Tamakan looked over the remains with eyes now a blind cataract white and glowing like marsh lights. Spell stitched and soulless, his would-be killer had been bound up with power burning it away from within. His enemies had drawn their plans and hidden their tracks well, a body too damaged for him to possess, should he have need to, and with no spirit for his shaman and sorceress to torture into confession, only a near mindless animating force woven from the winds of magic, driven to kill and know nothing more. Who had sent it? 
The battle wizards of the Empire, or a dark master closer to home? A would-be usurper of his lordship, perhaps? It did not matter to Tamakan. It was no longer important. The thing that dragged its way out of the pit was far removed from the ogre tyrant the Maggot Lord had possessed in the Mountains of Morn. The creature's body had rotted further, swelled larger yet, and was twisted into a mockery of life in death. The stigmata of Nurgle reeked clearly upon it. Around it hung the reek of the grave and the murmurous voices of flies, and all those of Nurgle's faith who saw it fell to their knees and rededicated themselves afresh to their master, so clearly now on the edge of apotheosis. For Tamakan, the throne of chaos, was at hand. Tamakan was no longer capable of mortal speech, it seemed, but his words could be discerned well enough by the acolytes around him in the maddening drone of the corpse flies that fed off their master, and as a bleak procession of tainted demon kind followed him up from the black pit, scores of inhuman things leering and cavorting on palsied limbs. The maggot lord's meaning was clear. The hour had come, and none would know the wrath of chaos. Chapter 6 On the day of the final battle, the Chaos Horde moved as one towards the great city, a great strung-ed line nearly a dozen leagues across, advancing in the darkness before dawn from the southwest. There was little order or unity, but with Tamakan's reappearance and transfiguration, a sense of purpose and destiny had fallen upon the Horde again, a purpose that would not be denied. This was to be the day of days, the day when the merciless gods looked down and rewarded glory and punished failure. A red day, a day of blade and spell and claw, of carnage and triumph. For none, perhaps, it was the end of days. At the centre of the chaos battle line was the maggot lord himself, riding back the toad dragon Bubolus. The great beast cowed somewhat by what its master had become, the foul miasma that poured in brackish floods like ochre-black fog from Tamokan's body, a heady elixir for the devotees of the plague god who clustered around him. In his train came the remnants of the followers, champions and warriors who had been his boon companions and acolytes since the battlefield of Zamjiban, which for them seemed a life age ago. Many of them now transformed beyond all recognition by the blessings and afflictions of their corrupt patron. With them came a fresh coterie of Nurgle's demon get, plague riders and tallymen, half-formed slug-like nightmares and chittering royals of foul Nurglings. At the flanks of this core of retainers came those who enjoyed the Maggot Lord's favour, packs of Hungering bile trolls, decaying chaos spawn, brute warbands of plague ogres, and the rusted and mouldering armoured hulks of Kaizak the Befeld's rot knights, trailing behind and not too close, lest the Lord of Decay's touch caress them, came the mass of the horde in their thousands, a hundred petty warbands, the subhuman detritus of chaos. The lost and the damned, mutants and rabble, the half-starved remnants of the Bray Herd, chained siege giants and such monstrous beasts and nameless creatures of chaos that yet lived to be swept on in Tamokan's wake. Far away on the Horde's left flank, following the banks of the Upper Reich, came a second shadow army. A sea of dark riders, chaos knights and Kurgan marauders, Dolgan Khans and Wastelander wagon altars, draped with skeins of flesh. At its centre rode Sal the Faithless atop a carved throne of ivory borne on the back of a scarred war mammoth. One of only a dozen that had survived the long trek to this final battle. It was Sal now, those Kurgan who did not share Tamokan's faith, looked to for leadership and direction, and to interpret the Chaos God's signs. Tamokan's horde was a shadow of death on the land. A third threat to the city came slowly but inexorably from the southeast. 
Between the two chaos forces, the horizon southward of Nong was blackened into twilight, and its voice was the rumble of an oncoming storm. Crossing the river at the Dacker House Tower Bridge came a disciplined five-bar column of black iron and hissing steam, the Legion of Asgore, the burning wing shape of Cinderbreath, the Bale Taurus, circling low overhead, with Lord Drazoth, gazing down with calculating malice on the scene unfolding before him. If any had been in a position to observe, they may have divined that of the three armies that now snaked their way towards Nuln's walls, the Chaos Dwarves were the most cautious in their progress, and also, whereas the Horde had deserted the lands behind them, leaving them barren and empty, the Legion of Asgore, had left a garrison to await them at Dacker House and kept open a line of retreat. The defenders of Nuln had deployed to prepared positions to defend their city in the chill hours of dawn, the fate that had befallen Faldorf foremost in their minds. Countess Emanuela's generals and knights masters had determined to operate a defence in depth the majority of their forces meeting the horde in the open field where they would be able to manoeuvre and, if needs be, fall back through a series of defensive lines, finally ending in the city's fortifications. In this they hoped to prevent the horde massing in strength, either its numbers, monstrous beasts or magic against a single point on the city walls and shattering through a breach as they had done in Faldorf. Nor would they allow the strange and devastating war machines that had crushed Fardorf to advance within range of the city. The plan called for their destruction at any cost. To this end, nearly a full thousand knights, mounted pistoliers and free riders, had drawn up on the rolling downs to the west of the city, while serried ranks of state troops, spearmen, halberdiers, handgunners and cannon batteries awaited the horde upon the raised banks of the flood levees that dominated the peninsula where the mighty rivers of the Avar and the Upper Reich met. It was this boggy expanse that was the Empire's chosen killing ground and the bulwark on which they hoped to shatter the horde in sight of the great city, but no closer. Among the thousands that defended the city of Nuln were more than mere soldiers, for this was a matter of faith as much as survival to some, and for the insane flagellant cults devoted to Sigma and the zealots of half a dozen other faiths, martyrdom in the face of the great enemy was a fate to be almost embraced. While at strategic points in the Empire lines, battle wizards from the Colleges of Magic awaited the ultimate test of their own arcane craft in the fight to come. Many having never witnessed such portentous turbulence in the unseen winds of magic that whipped and eddied across the skies and sank, formless like fast-rushing rivers through the earth, heralding what was to come. Fate had drawn many to this hour of deadly conflict, and while Elspeth von Draken watched from the back of her carmine dragon as it clutched to a high cathedral spire like a terrifying living gargoyle, she could feel the almost heartbeat-like pulse of the talisman she had gifted to Theodore Bruckner, the Countess's champion, to protect him from the foul magics of the arch-enemy. Bruckner's role in the battle plan was a simple, if almost impossible one. He was to seek out Tamokan, the master of the Horde, and slay him, an act that alone might make the difference this day between victory and defeat. Her occult senses, attuned to the ebb and flow of life and death, as only an initiate of the Amethyst Order could be, picked out a score of bright burning souls below her, who might find glory beyond lesser men, or see their spirit candles brutally snuffed out, as merciless chance determines. Not least of all that of Lightpole the Black, given command of the free riders, whose lust for vengeance was so great she could almost taste it like bitter blood and copper on her tongue. The day of destruction was born slowly, pale mists clinging to the damp earth, and a thousand breathless prayers were offered up to the gods of mankind and screamed in exultation to the lords of ruin. The sun rose up like a bloody beacon to light the way and battle was joined. 
The Empire's Ford battery spoke first. Wasting no time, they hurled rapid volleys of cannon fire into the advancing mass of Tamokan's vanguard at extreme range. These long-barreled cannon, lighter than their counterparts at the centre of the Empire lines, but still as deadly, and against so great a target they could scarcely fail to find their mark. Bodies of men and beasts were torn asunder by the steady bombardment, but the horde carried on without fear or regard, its ranks seeming never to falter as shot after shot was poured from the soon red-hot cannon. Closer and closer came the horde, and soon the state troops arrayed in defensive squares could begin to see the true horror of the foe that had come to claim their lives. Some quaked, others began hurried prayers for deliverance, but the ranks held steady, hard-eyed veterans adding quiet steel to the resolve of those around them, as firebrand warrior priests went up and down the lines, calling upon Holy Sigma's wrath to smite the hated servants of chaos. Hounds sounded in the low mists, at the extreme west of the Empire Line, where the defences butted up against the riverbank, but were soon drowned out by the thunder of hooves as the Kurgan came screaming in a tide of blurred motion and flashing iron. Along the banks of the Upper Reich, the defences centred on Asher's levee were commanded by Graf Asmer Tolbrook, and four regiments of state troops from the non Grey Cloaks, backed with a detachment of knights' bloodied spur and a strong battery of cannon, some four hundred men and a score of war machines. But it was as nothing against the onslaught of the Kurgan. They came on like a great black spearhead, and the Empire line shivered and shattered at its touch. Redoubts were overwhelmed in moments, horsemen trampling down fleeing artillery crew, and a whirlwind of flashing blades cleaved bloody slaughter through those brave enough to stand before the storm. The glittering, armoured knights of the Empire countercharged, and were instantly smashed apart and sent reeling and splintered through a vortex of stabbing spears and flailing axes. And at the heart of the storm was Sal the Faithless, raining down blasts of bale lightning and malevolent curses from his high throne like a wrathful god, as the shifting horror that was Nightmore, the spawn, screamed and flailed behind him to be let loose in the carnage below. Through the defences of Asher's levee the Kurgan rode, and none could stand before them. In the centre of the Empire's line, Removed from the carnage by the river by several leagues, a huge ball of fire suddenly soared high into the air before seeming to hang immobile in the sky like a second sun. Then at last it began, the inevitable fall to earth. The plunging missile blazed so brightly that the whole army of the Empire was bathed in its angry light. The ranks faltered for a moment, and then... The orb struck the ground with a mighty crash, erupting into a ball of all-consuming flame. The whole battlefield felt the impact. The troops from both sides clung to weapons that shook in their hands. Horses bucked and their riders struggled to hold them. So it was that the Legion of Asgur announced their presence. The fiery invocation had come from the centre of a great iron-caged pyre mounted on the back of an iron-wheeled altar so large it needed to be pulled by three iron demon engines, and around it the Chaos Dwarfs swarmed with uncanny and unnerving position, forming a diamond-shaped deployment at the edge of a cannon range from the levy defence lines of the Empire troops, quickly setting up firing positions with their snaking war machine trains, whose clanking and hellish hissing cries could be heard clear to the city walls. Where the fireball landed, nothing remained but a huge smoking crater, a great black pit upon the green sward. Fortunately for the men of the Empire, the blazing missile fell just short of their main gun line and had instead obliterated one of the furthest forward battery dugouts. Though some of the other gunners behind had abandoned their position in sheer terror, they soon returned and began to open up with the full panoply of cannon and mortar at their disposal. White clouds of smoke broke out all along the front of the Empire army, and soon cannonballs could be heard whistling through the air in furious numbers as they plummeted upon the Chaos Horde. 
Within a short time, the artillery duel grew intense. Missiles of all kinds flew between the armies, and the battlefield soon clouded with drifting gun smoke as the horde, heedless to its casualties, drew inexorably on. Each side aimed to destroy the artillery of the other, as without artillery, either army would be obliged to close upon the other at a great disadvantage. The Imperial Army possessed many more cannon than the Chaos Dwarfs, but at such long range only the largest guns had enough reach to strike back at the Chaos Dwarfs' position, and so most were forced instead to try to thin the ranks of the Horde as best they could before the inevitable and unholy charge. The death toll on both sides was hideous, and once the skilled gunners of the famous Noln Artillery School found their range, they dropped fire accurately into the Chaos Dwarf positions. One shot carried away an ogre loader, who burst apart, showering the Hellsmith artillerymen with the creature's toxic innards. Another cannonball landed into a sisson of mortar bombs and ripped a gash into the earth with an explosive blast which shook the ground for a league around and sent infernal guard flying into the air like scattered toys. The Chaos Dwarf made weapons were designed for the slow pace of siege warfare, and their missiles were time-consuming to prime and cumbersome to load. For every shell that hurled towards the opposing ranks, a hundred cannonballs spun and bounced towards the horde. But, despite this, they accounted for themselves with lethal force. The firepower of the Chaos Dwarf's weapons was suffused with all manner of horrific and demonic force, from great gouts of screaming power that devoured everything it struck, to bolts of molten metal hurled like blazing arrows across the field, and eldritch rockets which exploded their wrath high in the air, to see it race down screaming with diabolical intelligence to hungrily burn the flesh of its victims. Every missile the Chaos Dwarves loosed towards the enemy inflicted intolerable damage. Cannon after cannon disappeared beneath a ball of flame, and soon the front ranks of the Imperial Army were in visible disarray, although they held fast, their banners high in defiance. The lines closed, crossbow bolts shivered through the air, hideous war cries went up from both sides as the bravery of mortal men held fast to confront an army of inhuman horror and unquenchable bloodlust that hammered towards it. At two hundred paces, the Empire handgunners opened fire, a snarling crackle of flame and smoke, suddenly shrouding the defenders' lines, and a wave of bodies fell from the horde into the dirt, cut down as before a reaper's scythe. But the hideous creatures and mutated warriors of Tamokan came on unchecked, clambering over the bodies of their fallen. Close now, the horde broke up. The longer gate of the huge bile trolls and multi-limbed chaos spawn running ahead of the pack in their frenzied desire to destroy, while the demon tallyman of Nurgle droned on, maddeningly counting out a litany of the slain while festering clouds of blood-hungry flies swarmed towards the men of the Empire from the decaying ranks of Nurgle's children, as thick as a cloying fog. Meanwhile, high above the battlefield, the dragon rider Orbel Vipergut led a force of carrion vulture winged demons, tainted harpies, and leather winged manticore to darken the skies, to be met in rushing, screaming combat by white winged griffin riding knights and a trinity of fire wizards, mounted atop a burning wheel of fire and coal black iron while all around them the air was rent with shrieking rockets, arcane blasts and whistling shells, and blood fell, like misted rain as they clashed. Below, Kaisak the Befouled cantered at the head of his rot knights, forming the honour guard which rode in front of their master, Tamokan. The ground between the armies was now so loose and pitted that the pace of the heavy chaos riders was reduced, but sluggish progress mattered little now that the Empire's cannons had been largely silenced. In front of them, the enemy infantry tightened their formation to withstand a charge as the first of the beasts that ran ahead of the horde ravaged into their lines, closing ranks to stand shoulder to shoulder. Those in front braced their halberds against their right foot and readied their swords grimly to receive the charge. And Kaisak smiled wetly at their folly.
and false hope that they could withstand the death that closed on them. At a hundred paces a hail of arrows and bullets flew from across the halberdiers, arcing upwards and then down upon the chaos knights, but most rattled uselessly against the rusted and slime-coated armour of the rot knights, and bounced harmlessly from the heavy plates that protected their mounts. Only here and there did a missile find its mark piercing the wearer's armour at a joint, or perhaps finding some spot weakened too far by corrosion and canker. A few riders tumbled on the ground, and horses fell screaming, but the horsemen of pestilence rode relentlessly on. The Chaos Knights levelled their cruelly barbed lances and charged, their hellish gaunt steeds foaming black at the mouth with savage effort. A hundred paces distance became fifty, and fifty, ten. Then, unexpectedly, the front ranks of the enemy peeled away in desperate flight, revealing a trio of squat, multi barreled iron cannon chased in gleaming bronze. It would have been too late to abort their charge even if they had wished, and in the bleak joy of their tainted existence, the rot knights cared not for the danger. As the hell blaster volley guns erupted in sheets of flame from their spinning muzzles, each barrel discharged its load of a dozen or more small cannonballs. They cut a sway through the armoured knights, then opened gaps in the chaos ranks. Those who survived the cannon fire plunged straight into the enemy infantry. In places, the valiant footmen held their ground, but in others, they were scattered or cut down. Those rot knights, mounted upon their monstrous steeds, had little difficulty in overcoming the fence of gleaming halberd blades raised before them. Chaos-bred mounts crashed down upon the poor infantrymen, crushing the leading ranks and slashing those behind with steel-sharp hooves. As the riders impaled men bodily one to another with their lances in screaming slaughter and lay about themselves with festering, skull-headed fails, which champed and bit with venom-dripping teeth. But even where the Imperial regiments broke and fled, others quickly took their place as the second line advanced, and among them were regiments bedecked in the crimson and sable livery of the Countess's personal men-at-arms, steel-plated great swordsmen of the Exchequer Guard, with gold-chased double-handed blades as tall as they, and grim, grey-cloaked sellswords, with the coin of a dozen realms nailed to their buckles. Behind them came the great, gleaming war altar of the Archlector of Nuln, pulled by scores of bare-backed and bloody flagellants, while barely-armed and crazed zealots screamed and scourged themselves, and a great throng of unwashed bodies pressed around it, shouting out their eagerness for martyrdom in Sigmar's name. Soon, even the most deadly of the Chaos Knights and rampaging spawn at the fore of the fighting, found themselves outnumbered and surrounded by glittering spear points and blood-stained blades. But just as the tide appeared to turn again, with a deafening bellow, Bubolus the toad dragon and its terrible master entered the fray, with mutated giants and great plague demon things at his heels. Flesh liquefied before the toad dragon's foul breath, and scores of men fell screaming, as terrible diseases and afflictions erupted without warning, kindling like fire in their flesh as the demons of Nurgle drew close. Swift-footed beastmen came screaming from behind the tide of monsters, falling with animal savagery on the wounded and the isolated in a welter of blood. The battle raged on, and the Empire line began to buckle and be pushed back, and despite the desperate bravery and skill of the soldiery of Nuln, for against such wanton savagery and nightmare birthed might, even they could not prevail. Since in victory was at hand, the champions of chaos howled their cries to the dark gods and pressed on with renewed vigour, their cruel and tainted blades rising and falling in a tumult of death, while rippling mutant beasts, already gore-spattered and panting, threw themselves at the foe with renewed hunger to kill and devour. While battle roared on in the centre of the line, further west, near the banks of the river, it seemed victory had already been won for chaos, and all that was left was for the forces of the Kurgan horsemen to wheel round from their shattering of the Empire flank and turn on the centre, 
from the side with crushing force and tipped the balance of the entire battle at a single stroke. However, as Sal struggled to call the unruly and eager riders to order and begin to manoeuvre and form his army up to a charge, the Kurgan found themselves suddenly under fire from the river at their backs. Floating pontoon forts had made their way down the, from the city's river gates, their armoured decks crowned with mortars and archers, bearing the green and black livery of the river wardenry. The explosive shells falling on the Kurgan scattered them, just as Saal and the Khans were doing all they could to concentrate them, panicking horses and making the task of reforming for a charge all but untenable. Enraged marauders that attempted to counterattack were quickly dealt with as they attempted to swim the wide, fast-flowing Reich to reach the enemy, or were quickly swept away, and even the frightening spectacle of a war mammoth attempting to wade towards the pontoon was cut short, as every short, fused mortar shell, swivel gun, and volley after volley of arrows rained down on the mighty beast, and it soon sank beneath the thrashing black waters. Sal and the Khans restored some semblance of order eventually, and succeeded in pulling their riders away from the river and towards their intended target, but they had wasted precious time. The gift of respite had been used by the Empire forces to form up a second lateral defence line to try to hold the Kurgan horsemen from smashing in to the bloody central melee where the bulk of the horde was fighting, and which was even now sucking in more and more defending troops in an effort to stop the horde's advance, but which was still steadily losing ground to the monstrous foe. A single deployment from the city reserve had managed to form along the banks of Crow's Levee, in time to meet the Kurgan charge. The Noln Ironsides, the pride of the Imperial Gunnery School, under the command of their castellan, Jubal Falk. As the Kurgan marauders came on, they were met with wave after wave of disciplined gunfire, as Empire snipers took aim and felled war beasts and Khans, causing confusion in the ranks. Alchemist wizards of the College of Metal, long allied to the Ironsides by ancient bond and contract, wielded their arts to burn and scorch the enemy, igniting their foes' weapons into molten fire in their hands, while hidden mines were detonated in the sod, ripping apart horses and causing one war mammoth to rampage through the Kurgan's own ranks, blinded and driven insane with pain from the fiery blast. Despite the carnage inflicted on them, bands of Kurgan marauders slammed into the Ironsides, but their foes' discipline and the heavy armour of the Empire troops held them fast against the repeated attacks from the horsemen, although their casualties were great. At the height of the combat, Sal the Faithless was himself struck down, a burning bullet of mercurial shot smashing into his helm and toppling him, insensible from his throne. Soon the last of the great war mammoths of the northern wastes, still fighting, fell, crashing to the ground, its hide riddled with hundreds of bullet wounds, a titan laid low by bee stings. Leaderless and beset, the Kurgan's assault began to waver, when a deafening howl from the heavens drowned out all else in the tumult, as a dark shape crashed to earth from the skies above. The dragon carcass, burning with livid purple flame, came apart like an overripe melon as it hit the ground. The headless, broken body of Orbal Vipergut, pinwheeling across the ground nearby. Stunned into paralysis, all looked up as a wide pair of shadow-black wings darkened the sun and cast all in a shadow that bore with it the chill of the grave. Above them, the carmine dragon, of Elizabeth von Draken, lowered its glass-fanged maw and unleashed a blast of arcane power which scored across the Kurgan like a knife blade. Where the blackly burning amethyst light touched all was sundered into oblivion, flesh and steel withering like candle wax hurled into a blast furnace, and the ground itself screamed where the blast line touched. The pale scythe in Elizabeth's hand flashed, and far below men and beasts died, the life ripped from them, leaving nothing but desiccated husks. The battle wizards of the Golden College could do nothing 
but turn their masked faces away from the display of power and shudder while the Ironsides, that regained their wits, redoubled their efforts, pouring fire into the staggering Kurgan, who as one broken fled. The Battle of Crow's Levy had been won. The Empire flank, against all odds, had held. The day, well advanced now, past noon, and the entire battlefield was a shifting mass of mud and mayhem, with thousands toiling and killing in the mire. The swave of combat had interjected itself between the Chaos Dwarf contingent and the rearward Empire gun lines, cutting short their artillery duel. In response, the Legion of Asgoth had taken advantage of the respite to lick their wounds, and was now moving in column to redeploy to a more advantageous position to the west of the main battle line. Lord Drazov had no intention of miring his troops in the slaughter before him, and already had paid more in blood and machinery than he cared for Tamokan's cause. Instead, he would be content for his legion to wait out the outcome of the carnage and make his plans accordingly, preserving his war machines as needed, and perhaps even shelling the battle indiscriminately should it go against the Chaos forces. It was then, however, that there was a sudden commotion in the rearward ranks of the enemy. From the western flank of the great melee there burst a company of fresh-mounted troops who broke away from the Empire line and skirted the edge of the battlefield, galloping towards the Chaos Dwarf position at breakneck speed. These were followed moments later by war engines, the like of which Lord Drazov had never seen. Strange and spectacular, these four bizarre machines belched smoke and wheezed and clanked as if they were about to burst apart. At first he thought them to be the famed steam tanks of the Empire, but soon realised there was something else entirely. They were huge creations, far larger than his own iron demons, and fashioned incongruously in the image of sea warships, but hoisted high on wheels, and propelled by some crude steam engine, which even at this distance sounded fit to explode at any moment. Their decks teemed with soldiers and were frantic with activity. And with sudden shock, he watched armoured gun ports open in their bows to reveal the jutting barrels of cannon. Lord Drasov swore some terrible oath in dwarfish and immediately snapped orders to his attendants, who made haste to obey. And the column's machine train began to scream and clank slowly towards forming a defensive circle. The Chaos Dwarf Sorcerer Prophet watched the enemy's machines steam rapidly forward, and they did it so at far greater speed than they had ever seen any Chaos Dwarf engine of their size move. The land ships, he realised, had distracted him utterly from the darting horsemen, which were now drawing close at the gallop. As these riders approached, Drasov observed that some were armed with strange mechanical weapons of a kind he had never seen before. Their use and purpose was quickly revealed when clattering gunfire, faster than any Drashoff had ever witnessed, bar from the weird experimental weapons of the hated Skaven clan Skyre, rattled forth from the riders, spraying indiscriminately into the still-turning Chaos Dwarf column. The Infernal Guard moved lockstep into defensive positions and returned withering fire with firelock and hail-shot blunderbuss, shredding horses and riders alike. But Drazov cursed foully again, seeing the damage was already done, as the riders were already in amongst the column. Their target was now clear, as those few that still lived hurled iron sphere bombs with hissing fuses into the guns and gears of war machines and munition charges with devastating results. Lord Drazov urged Cinderbreath into the air as the land ships closed quickly upon the siege mortars and magma cannon, still stowed for transport, their hellsmiths frantically trying to make them ready to fire. With thunderous retorts, the land ships began to shower the weapon carriages with shot from their bow mounted cannons and fusillades of small arms fire from the fighting decks. A well aimed cannonball struck one of the vast mortars and in a shrieking explosion knocked it completely from its mounting, the Chaos Dwarf crew lying dead and mutilated amongst the mangled metal of their war machine. As the Chaos Dwarfs rallied to the defence, another wave of riders came through the trundling formation of land ships. There were near a hundred this time, liveried in ivory cloth and enamelled black armour, and armed with firearms of diverse kinds. 
Some carried multi-barrelled musket tunes, some braces of pistols, and others bore brass-mouthed guns that gaped open like blunderbusses. The cavalry stormed around the weapon carriages, loosing their fire upon the crewmen and slaves and causing great slaughter. As they did so, hard-eyed swordsmen repelled into the combat from the sides of the land ships and fought off all attempts by the dwarfs of Tsar to rescue their comrades. Enraged, Drazov issued the mental command for Cinderbreath to plunge into the attack. The huge burning beast did as he was bidden, and Drazov felt a thrill of pleasure as Cinderbreath bathed the deck of the nearest land ship in its breath of flame. The death screams of the crew caught in the open sweet music to the black-hearted sorcerer. With a sweep of his gnarled hand, he summoned the power of his dark god and covered a second land ship in a pall of cloaking black ash, while the first careened away, burning merrily. More hooves thundered, vastly more, and Drasov's alarm was replaced with triumph as hundreds of Kurgan horsemen thundered into view, but instead of joining the battle, they rode on by at speed, leaving the Chaos Dwarf Sorcerer to shout bitter curses after them for their cowardice. Meanwhile, Undeterred, the two remaining land ships turned clumsily about to attack the next column of machine carriages, but by now the Infernal Guard were engaged in a bitter fight with the enemy's horsemen and were quickly gaining the upper hand. Although the ragged-looking swordsmen fared better, their weird-looking standard seeming to shriek like a damned soul in torment. The land ships lumbered onwards more slowly now, for it appeared that they had expended much of their power during their rapid advance. They had taken fire from the cow's dwarfs, and now steam spat from gaping holes in the machine's sides. One landship, belched black smoke and flames sputtered from its chimney stack as the engine backfired noisily. Its companions blundered about, one blinded by ash and the other now blazing like a furnace, but the fourth incongruously slammed down its heavy anchor, and used the drag weight to turn sharply, crashing into a detachment of infernal guard that had formed up to fire on it. Its bow cannon spoke suddenly, and grape shot lacerated the chaos dwarfs, even their vaunted black shard armour next to useless against the cannon at point blank range. Lord Drasov launched Cinderbreath into a knot of enemy riders and laughed cruelly as the bale Taurus burned and gored them into unrecognisable hunks of scorched meat. The burning landship crashed into an iron demon head-on, and the pair exploded in a roaring fireball that sent splintered shrapnel scudding across the battlefield, punching a hole through Cinderbreath's wing and ricocheting off Drazov's armour. Bit by bit the landships were torn down, Wheels blasted apart, boilers pierced and weeping, and weapons bent and useless. A skullcracker engine found one that had stalled broadside. Its teeth bit into iron plate and chewed a hole through the hull with a crackling sound, and erupted from the other side in a shower of splinters, cutting the wooden beast in half. The few surviving riders and swordsmen beat a desperate retreat, as did the single rickety land ship that remained, smoking and bullet-ridden, as fast as its off-kilter wheels would carry it. But the damage had been done, and the Chaos Dwarfs were in no state to pursue. Treachery, Drazov howled into the skies. Then came the sound of trumpet blasts and the roaring thunder of hooves from the east loud enough to drown out even the clangour of the bloody battle, and soon the ground itself shook and vibrated in omen of what was to come. At the sound, Tamukan reared up his toad dragon and looked out across the swirling slaughter around him and saw a great wall of shining steel rushing toward them like a foaming wave, banners and pennants of black and gold, grey and scarlet snapping and flying above the knights of a dozen orders, Lance points levelled in a glittering tide of promised death. The thetid lord of Nurgle spurred into Bubolus, who let out a deafening cry of his own and turned to countercharge this new threat. The maggot lord, swinging around his great axe in wild demand for the horde to follow. 
Now it was the turn of the Horde to feel the keen-edged blades of their enemy and withstand the hurricane force of the Knight's mass charge. The shock of the Empire Cavalry's impact sundered into the Horde, which fractured but did not break before the onslaught. It was those humanoid warriors on foot, the whirling marauders, howling beastmen and degenerate mutants that took the worst of the blow and died in their hundreds in the first moments as the glittering column of steel and vengeful ire slammed into the melee. But they were not alone, and even hulking plague ogres clad in chaos dwarf-forged black metal fell in scores, pierced in a dozen places by the lances of the knights. Behind the first arrowhead wave of knights came a second charge of free riders and pistoliers who darted through the melee seeking targets of their own, discharging wheel-lock guns into towering monstrosities at point-blank range or hurling demi-lances into the backs of hulking chaos warriors already caught up in savage combat, little caring if a few of their fellow soldiers were struck in the process. Here and there, the actinic flashes of magic revealed the presence of battle wizards in the thundering charge, as searing blasts of pure white light burned into the rancid flesh of Nurgle's demon tallymen, scorching them into oblivion, while a vast tangle of murderous living thorns erupted from the earth, catching a clutch of festering bile trolls in their deadly embrace, and try as they might, the hulking monsters could not break free, and only managed to rend and puncture their ever-knitting flesh over and over in the attempt. But if the charge of Noln's massed cavalry was meant to be a decisive blow to end the battle in the Empire's favour, it failed, and instead only managed perhaps to even the battle once more. Within minutes, the warring forces became hopelessly interpenetrated, and the impetus of the charge was completely lost as the knights and free riders became mired in countless separate hand to hand struggles. The savage axes of the chaos warriors were turned on the new foe, cutting down rider and horse alike with their inhuman strength, and soon the bloated beasts of Nurgle were pulling knights from their mounts and even picking up horses, riders and all, before crushing and rending them in their tentacled grasps. A great bone-grinder giant, taller than a watchtower, its pale flesh mutilated by masses of weeping sores, strode over a battery palisade and began to pick up the great cannon there and flung them towards the oncoming Empire cavalry as easily as a boy might hurl stones at skittles. The carnage, the flying metal cause to the onrushing knights, was abruptly ended when the giant toppled, screaming to the ground, as a wound-crazed griffin, a riderless and bloody saddle trailing behind it, slammed like a cannonball into its chest and powered away with whooshing wing-beats, taking what was left of the giant's face with it as red tatters trailing from its gleaming claws. Where there had been the central defence line of the Empire forces was now a vast whirling melee miles across, an orderless, leaderless slaughter on a nightmarish scale, where no quarter was given and the screams of the dying hung in the air, echoing as far as the streets of the great city where refugees huddled in fear at the sound. The ground, already a morass of blood and mud, became a quagmire of gore and twitching bodies, both sides knew instinctively that whoever won this deadly gauntlet would win the day, and more and more reinforcements from both sides were fed into this vortex of blood, and the skies above grew black and turbulent, as if the sun refused to look upon the horror visited below. As the day waned, the bloody stalemate drew on with no sure victory in sight for either side, who fought desperately on with thousands now left dead at their feet. Tamokan broke free of the battlefront, and Bubolus, now bearing the scars of a score of weeping wounds, sheared off lance points jutting from its armoured scales, limping on its rear limb, where a fireball had charred its knee down to blackened bone. The maggot lord's mind, half insane with the unbridled savagery of the day and the reek of carnage around him, still grasped that by simple attrition the Empire would eventually win as matters stood, and perhaps had already slain enough of his forces so that they were not enough strength to breach the city's defences. 
Enraged beyond measure, he called to him his commanders, mortal and demon alike, to answer for their failure. Where were the Kurgan riders? Why had they not joined the fray? And with his own eyes he could see the plumes of black smoke from the Chaos Dwarf machine trains withdrawing from the field. Did they believe their work was done? Nurgle, take them! Tamakan listened aghast to reports of the Kurgan riders' flight from the field to scatter across the rolling hills behind, and choked with mounting fury to the realisation that victory was being stanched away from him. All was lost. The throne of chaos, so tantalisingly close, was being snatched from his grasp, and yet, and yet, the demons whispered in his mind. There was perhaps another way. As twilight fell on the great field of slaughter, the battle finally ebbed away, and the acolytes of the plague god broke off their assault, leaving only a few insane and uncontrollable monsters to fight on in their stead, falling back into the gathering gloom. Behind them they left the survivors of the Empire armies numb and exhausted, and in no fit state to mount any kind of pursuit, even if they wished it. The death toll had been staggering, and no right accounting could easily be given of the losses Nol had sustained, but they were without doubt appalling. That could be plainly seen and felt by the empty-eyed, stumbling and wounded soldiers that staggered back across the great bridge that spanned the river to the city, handfuls of men remaining from regiments that had numbered in the hundreds, the citizenry that awaited them, women and children, old folk for the main, curiously silent, attended to them as best they could, with bandages and food, ale and blankets, but over the whole city a pall of foreboding and quiet had fallen, where perhaps there should have been triumph. The skies above grew darker yet, blotting out the moon and stars. All could feel the fearful change in the air, a nameless horror was about to be born. In the court of the Countess all was a frenzy of activity, with mounting shock as news of the fallen came in. It was the almost ghostly figure of Elspeth von Draken, who it seemed had paled to a mere shadow that cut through the court with news of the direst import. Something was happening on the banks of the Upper Reich, south of the city. Something terrible that might yet spell the doom of them all. The air was heady with the reek of rotting blood and boiling corruption. And to Tamakan it was well and good as he mounted the shattered steps to the marble wellhead. The freshly defiled ruin that had once been an abbey dedicated to the pathetic goddess of healing, uh, the squealing men of the empire called Shalea, the entrails of her clergy freshly smeared on its walls. He had been wrong. He understood that now. His thinking, this lust for paltry conquests, had all been wrong. His desires, petty, mortal. His father in decay cared not for the baubles of victory or the trinkets of kingship. He was the silence of the grave, the mourning voices of flies, the wisdom of the canker worm, and his prayer was the dying tainted breath of a plague-struck body. Now Tamakan would take this empire of man and remake it into a shape more pleasing to his master. Death, death, and decay were all. The battle had served its true purpose, and now ten thousand and more bodies lay rotting, scattered across the earth, and had given him the power to work this dark malevolence. It was never enough, though. All must die. He had sent out his followers to slay and die in Nurgle's name in the night, unleashed all his beasts of war as aimless and indiscriminate as miasma on the wind. And distantly, at Dacker House, the treacherous Chaos Dwarves had unleashed their fires in a vain effort to survive the vengeful assault of Kaisak and the Chosen, while winged carrion things, now hunted horsemen, that had sworn to serve him long ago in the wastes. He had taken the life of his faithful servant, Bubolus, with his own hands, 
opening its throat with his great axe and letting the black blood soak into the earth and fester. He was shriven now of all ties to his mortal past. Tamakan staggered down into the waters of the sacred well and upended the black amphora of contagion over himself, grinning as at its touch his diseased flesh sloughed liquidly from his distorted bones under the caress of the filthy waters of Nurgle's domain. The waters around him immediately began to boil and twist. The wind rose and fell and rose again until it became an unending howl of despair. The ground shook in surly protest. Trees swayed in agony beneath the wind, a relentless battering, while the waters of the river churned as if trying to flee the bondage of its banks. But nothing could escape from the grip of the curse Tamokan had wrought, not even the earth itself. An oily slick spread over the waters, which congealed and thickened in seconds, and the skies were racked by peals of thunder and flashes of lurid green lightning. From bank to bank, no water stirred beneath the maelstrom, for all had curdled to bubbling sludge and slime, the stain spreading across the waters with nightmarish speed. Dark and hideous forms shifted and began to drag themselves up from the slime and from the shadows of the desecrated abbey. Drone-voiced demon tallymen shambled forward to greet the tide of their fell kin, erupting in scores from the beyond. Tamokan struggled up, his wrecked ogre body bloating and distending, the maggot worm within shuddering and pulsing. There was very little left of mortal flesh, however tainted, within him now, and when the demon stain flowed as far as the great city and the countless legions of plague brought death to its streets, there would be nothing mortal left of him at all, and he would be as they, revelling in corruption and despair for all eternity, rot without end. A sudden flash of purple-white fire flared on the landward edge of the abbey compound, throwing into sharp relief the teeming multitude of hellishly twisted flesh dragging itself out of the river. Tamokan snarled. They would not stop him. Not now. In Nuln, in the court of the Countess, all was a frenzy of activity. Washed over with the mounting shock of the news of the fallen. It was the almost ghostly figure of Elizabeth von Draken, who it seemed had paled to a mere shadow that cut through the court with news of the direst import. Something was happening on the banks of the Upper Reich, south of the city, something terrible that might spell yet their doom. The assault on the fallen Abbey of the Lilies was a desperately arranged affair, it would not have been possible without the combined reserves of arcane power possessed by the near-exhausted battle wizards of Nong. The conjurations that let them speed and twist distance back upon itself to allow the war party to strike before it was too late were so grave that the grey wizard who wove the spell was consumed by it, burning coldly away to a cloud of fine ash in the casting. A ragged column of knights, the blooded survivors of a dozen orders who had endured the battle of the day, launched the attack, spearheaded by the Countess's champion, Theodore Bruckner. Riding the savage demigriff Reaper, the talisman at his neck flaring with amethyst light as it encountered the supernatural miasma that fogged the desecrated abbey. With them came warrior priests and foot soldiers, swordsmen and wizards, all volunteers who knew their survival was far from likely. Above them the carmine dragon's wings beat the wind-tortured air, and the shadowy form of Elizabeth von Draken raised up her glimmering scythe which crackled with pale fire. The armies of hell 
rose up to meet them. Demon savagery tore at the knights, fetid claws, gutting war horses and dragging them down. But even as they died, the armoured warriors slammed their lances into cataracted Cyclopean eyes and drove their blessed blades deep into swollen demon flesh. Zealots screamed and flung themselves fearlessly to their deaths. Scourges swung wildly while holy prayers drove back hulking plague toads, burning them as if the purest vitriol acid had been poured over their flesh. The shifting, savage form of a wizard from the Amber College matched claw for claw and fang for fang against the horror, but was quickly smothered and disappeared beneath a mass of rusted blades and scabrous limbs. The sorcerous breath of the carmine dragon lashed out, burning a blinding light across the abbey, and smote the chest of a great unclean one, which struggled to free its house-sized bulk from the choked river of decaying flesh and writhing limbs. But it was evident it would all be for nothing if they could not act quickly, for they were simply too few and the coming demon legion seemingly without number or limit. Tamokan was the key and it was he that must die before the ritual reached its zenith, and a plague the likes of which had never been seen was unleashed upon the Empire. Reaper bounded, with long talon sure strides towards Tamokan, shouldering the plague-bearer Tallyman who rose up to bar its path aside, pausing to savagely grab one and shake it to pieces in its razor-sharp beak, and fling it aside as a cat might a mouse. Bruckner raised his cold blade above his head and shouted out his challenge, undaunted. The enraged Tamakan, fearless and defiant, was swift to answer, yanking out the great axe from the tainted earth beside the body of the toad dragon and running full pelt towards the demigrith with a staggering gait, bones rattling wetly within his decaying flesh. Arcane fire burst upon Tamokan and swathed him in torment, causing him to stagger, and in that moment of distraction, Reaper was on him, its scythe-like talons a blurred frenzy, slashing rotting meat from diseased bone, its beak shooting forward and plucking the rotted head of the ogre clean from its body. Tamokan reeled, but did not fall and the great axe licked out in a whistling side-sweep and caught the demigriff in the breast, stoving in the noble beast's ribcage and cleaving its beating heart in two. Reaper reared up, screaming in death agony, dragging the axe from the maggot lord as it did so. Bruckner barely managed to scramble clear in time as the demigriff collapsed, dead as a felled tree, and came up swinging, his enchanted blade stabbing and hacking relentlessly at the flailing bulk of the headless Tamokan, scoring wound after wound on the tainted flesh. The inhuman horror collapsed to one knee under the onslaught. Gushing foulness filled with writhing black worms spilled across Bruckner, and gagging, he staggered backwards, staggered and slipped. It was enough for the maggot lord to do its work. The obscene creature lurched forward like a striking cobra and fastened itself over Theodore Bruckner's terrified face, crunching through leather and bone and pulsing and writhing within the flesh, delicate bones splintering like pistol shots as the maggot forced its way down. Here was a proud vessel that would be the last he would ever need. He would not be denied. He was eternal. He was. The talisman around Bruckner's neck burst into furious life, like a burning star unleashed in the night. In a roaring flash, there was nothing but blackened, crumbling bone where the Countess's champion had stood, and in an instant later, even that had been consumed, and Tamokan the Maggot Lord with it. High above the battle, Elizabeth von Draken watched the fire flash and allowed herself a brief moment of satisfaction in the instant before the storm of magic the Maggot Lord had drawn to himself abruptly cut and folded back on itself catastrophically. Her design had come to fruition. A whipcord of oblivion snapped shut over the spot where Tamakan had stood within a hair's breadth of demonhood and all was laid waste. The banks of the river thundered upwards and quaked, and the children of Nurgle were scattered and withered to filthy ribbons of ash in the span of a heartbeat. 
the Abbey of the Lilies and all within it ceased to be, and in the wide crater that replaced it a tangled mass of tortured green-black glass pierced the ground like a vile dagger stabbed into the earth. The carmine dragon fell lifeless from the sky, and Elizabeth von Draken faded like smoke in the night. And so ended the saga of Tamokan, who sought the throne of chaos. And what have I, his chronicler, blinded by burning metal, abandoned and scorned by my people, I, who had risen so high, who men called faithless, was left a beggar upon the road in a realm of the lost and the desolate, contemned by the dark gods to my black penance, a stranger in a strange land, but far from helpless. And soon, my story shall also be told. Hello! So I hope you enjoyed that. Bit of fantasy for a change. I've been meaning to do some fantasy stuff for a while, so this is my first uh, first uh, go at that. <laughs> and Tamakan is such a unique book in and of itself. Uh, it was the only real major campaign book that was ever released for fantasy, towards the end as well. Uh, it's written by Alan Bly, a sort of, you know, a god within Games Workshop history. He, one of the guys who really sort of made some of the most awesome things in 40K, and he did this in fantasy. Um, the only other book they released that was similar to this was a Forge World exclusive as well. Uh, it was Monstrous Arcanum, which was a book that went through, like in character, uh, went through all the different um, uh, unique and terrible beasts that you didn't normally see in fantasy, but like interesting, like disgusting creatures. And you could all buy, yeah, obviously, you could buy all of them from Forge World. Uh, the same thing with the Tamakan, but you know, you could buy through Forge World, you know, buy all toads, Tamakan himself on his big dragon thing um there was some special empire units and stuff i looked on ebay actually i'm like they go for extortionate amounts of money now and they're really beautiful models but yeah this was like a really i mean i remember when it, I, I got it when it first came out and it was like wow you know all the chaos dwarf stuff was brand new basically we hadn't seen chaos dwarves in like 15 20 years so it was great to see them revive that faction and that part of the lore and that part of the warhammer world and give it this unique taste uh unique twist and this new look, this new... They look so cool. The, the Infernal Guard in, are insanely good-looking, like, just as conceptually, they look... At, ooh, sorry. <laughs> they look they look amazing. But, um, yeah, it was the first time we'd seen them. This was all brand new. And this, and it, I, I wish they did more of these things, and I hope they do in the future. They've started to do it in 40K now, like, unique lore tomes covering certain events, you know? And, obviously, it had campaign rules in there and rules for all the new units, Chaos Dwarf units. But yeah, great stuff. Um, great walk down memory lane for me. Uh, tremendous stuff. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I will be returning soon. I mean, I'll I'll I'll, I'll slip in fantasy stuff now and again. I got I got uh, I think I'm going to do a fairly big fantasy project in the not too distant future. But for the time being, I might just do occasional bits and bobs. I've got one little short thing I think is really cool um, that I found in a white dwarf. Uh, I remember reading it in the white dwarf, in fact, and uh, I went. And, I didn't know I had that white dwarf. I had it for a different reason. I can't remember what. Maybe it was like for a chapter approved thing. But they've got this in there as well. And uh, it's pretty sick. So hopefully I'll bring that to you guys in the not too distant future. Well, within a couple of weeks. And yeah, just for those of you who've been watching regularly and those of you who've been supporting the channel, thank you for your continued support. I'm hoping to ramp up production now as we go into 2024. Mostly because my kids stop teething now so I can actually sleep and I don't walk around like a zombie. Uh, for months at a time. So, yeah, I'm actually getting decent sleep at the moment. <laughs> Until his back teeth come in, I guess. But for the time being, I'm I'm going to be putting out as much content as I can. And, uh, yeah, thank you for supporting me, even though content's been a bit bare over the last couple of months. So, yeah, I'll be back again with more stuff soon. I'm going to stop ranting. I hope you enjoyed this. I love fantasy. Uh, I thought it was, you know, such a shame for it to go. I'm glad it's come back. It's very odd. I might do a video about that as well. I'll discuss some of the oddities with that. But we'll see. I can't. I don't know. I've got a schedule, boys. I've got a list of things to do, and I, I can't keep adding things to it because I don't get anything done. This is my problem. <laughs> All right. I'm just. I just try and do too much, you know. And I'm a really humble guy. Anyway, I'll see you later. Thanks very much. Thanks for supporting the channel. And it, please do consider supporting the channel as well. It really helps uh, with uh, YouTube membership or on Patreon. Really appreciate that. I'll add your name to the mighty roll of honor here, like all these fine, upstanding gentlemen. And uh, please do like the video. Let me know in the comments what you think. These things all help a channel like mine grow. And um, 
Yeah, it helps with the algorithm, you know, all this. Anyway, ta-ra. Bye-bye.